Hello, hello. Oh, I had to unmute my mic. Oh, no worries. Welcome, Justin. How are you? I'm doing well. Sorry, I was. I I, I quickly made the. Uh, I quickly made my uh, Reddit post just so it could accumulate some questions while we're yeah. chatting here. Fantastic. That's what usually happens. I was just telling people now that if they have to go midway through or something like that, and their question still hasn't been answered or they didn't get a chance to ask it, um, it it's a very good place to have that that post as a collection pot, so to speak, for for questions. So thanks very, very much for being here. I was just saying hi to everybody. So I'll take a moment to say hi to everybody again. Um, how are you? How is life? I'm doing well. Yeah, I. Uh, it's been pretty warm here in Vernon, British Columbia. So I've been getting out quite a bit and uh, paddle boarding and things like that. So it feels like, uh, you know, when, when it gets to summer here, John and I start to slow down a bit and try to get outside more. And I've been able to do that more this week. So yeah, it feels good. I've seen that on your story and on, sorry, on the fleets, because that's how they call them on Twitter. And it looks amazing. It looks very uh, relaxing. And I get that. Is it in any way inspired by the base camp? Uh, we work 32 hours a week sort of thing, or is it just more of a give and take flexible sort of schedule? Yeah, it's we, well, traditionally I have not been very good at taking breaks. And so, uh, after years and years of, you know, really grinding and w working, frankly, too many hours a week, I, I was mostly inspired by my friend Paul Jarvis. Just every year, he would slow down in the summer and he would slow down uh, around, uh, you know, the beginning of December. And he just had this nice cadence that I was always jealous of. And so when John and I started, I said, let's, let's just implement this in our calendar. So in early December, we have on the calendar, it says slow down. And yeah, around June, uh, we have in our calendar, slow down. And it reminds both of us to not start any big projects, to take, you know, put some things on the calendar, to take some time off. And we're, we're not perfect at it, but we're, we're trying to get better at it. That makes a lot of sense. So let's just start right off the bat. I was just making a post now telling people what I'm going to say right now as well, which is to anybody listening here, thanks first of all for being here. Feel free to request the mic using that button in the lower left corner. I'm just going to start with Justin so we can get the ball rolling with a couple of questions. Uh, but then really the floor is to everybody who's, who's joining here. So if you queue, I'm going to add your speakers. You're going to have a chance to ask Justin. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm assuming he'll be happy to, to answer these questions. But coming back to what you were saying, Justin, I'm very curious about that because I think most bootstrappers, especially once their ball starts rolling, get that thing of, you know what, maybe I should slow down. Maybe the job gets better, gets done in a better way if I slow down. Do you mind talking to us a bit about how your experience has been once you made that yearly December calendar mark of taking things? What, was it December? Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we just started implementing that. I mean, it's, it's, so much of this depends on uh, the, the, the product itself having strong demand and having good fundamentals. You can't really, you can't really do any of these, these healthy practices if, you know, so for example, before I was just um, hustling on a bunch of different projects and trying to cobble together, you know, I'll get this going over here and then I'll get this mm. going over here and maybe, all of these stacked up together can, you know, equal a full-time income and, a, and uh, you know, an independent life. But it wasn't until uh, we built Transistor and there was strong demand, strong inherent demand for the product. It was like the difference between being on a rushing river and you're just kind of going with the flow and steering your boat as you go. And as opposed to before being on a, a slow stream and, you know, just really paddling hard to, to go fast. 
And so the having momentum, having a product that had momentum was really helpful and enabled us to, you know, have the freedom and the, the flexibility and the margin to take more time off and, and to be able to do it at, as a very small company. Uh, right now we're three full-time people, but up until last month, we were only, it was just John and I. That makes sense. So for those of us on, on the other side, so to speak, uh, what, what has been your finding? Is it more of a luxury you can afford because you set up Transistor to be a healthy business? Or so let me phrase this better. Do you do it for yourself personally? Or does it also have effects on your professional life in the sense that after this break or after this period of taking it slower, you go harder? Does, that, does, that, does my question make sense? Yeah. So my current, my current theory hmm. is that the market you're in determines almost everything. It determines how much growth you're going to experience. It determines the ceiling uh, for your potential. It determines the fundamentals, the economics. And so there are certain, there are, for example, we know that, that there are certain jobs that are just difficult. Like if you want to be an actor in Hollywood, there is you know, so many people vying for those jobs and it's only the top 0.01% that are able to get there. And it just takes a lot of hours, a lot of hustle to get there. And you might have to have, uh, you know, invest a decade in trying to make it happen. And there's still no guarantees. I think with business, we can, we can do that same kind of calculus and go after market opportunities that have good fundamentals, strong demand, and match up well with our personal advantages and strengths. And some, some markets are just better than others. Some markets will give you more margin than others. Mm -hmm. uh, some markets will support a calm company better than others. And that's the piece I think people are missing. They're hustling so hard to get to their, you know, to build something independent, carve out uh, a life for themselves, which I totally get and is worthwhile doing. But the, the key is that first decision you make. What market, what product category am I going to go after? And is it going to support the life that I want? And you can determine this by looking at the incumbents. You know, if, if you look at, you know, five competitors in that space and all of the CEOs are, are on Twitter or on podcasts saying, uh, yo, I, I, I work 100 hours a week and you know, I just <laughs> wake up at 5 a.m. and don't go to bed till 1 a.m. Um, that's probably a bad sign, right? The there's, hustle for There's going to be some categories that just – enable this more than others. And you can also make conscientious decisions once those fundamentals are there. Once the pull of the market is there, you can make conscientious decisions about how you're going to structure your company. And those can also lead to a sense of calm. And I think this is, I think this is accessible to a lot of people. Uh, you might need a little bit of experience under your belt before you can kind of figure this out. Um, but it, you know, I've seen 20 year old entrepreneurs do this and I've seen 60 year old entrepreneurs do this. Uh, the key is to go after a market that has uh, strong or growing demand evidence that people are already searching for a product like this or a solution like this. And once you have that, once there, you can see there's a rushing river, uh, that's where you should, you know, put your boat in and start steering it and seeing if you can make it happen. As opposed to just, you know, anytime you, you find water, putting your boat in the water and, and then just paddling as hard as you can. That makes sense. And I think you've written before about 
I mean, I, I know at least I've seen some tweets, if not an article on Justin Jackson, that CA, which uh, I like reading, by the way, uh, written before about the importance of of tailwinds as the startup literature calls it. But as you very well pointed out, just the, the market you're choosing. But back to the question I was putting, tell us practically if after this period of taking it slower, when you come back to work, do you feel like you have more... I hate saying this word productivity because it became a, a dirty word, so to speak. But tell us if you work better or more effective after you take it slower. Yeah. Uh, see, it's really more than this. What, what I'm trying to articulate, because I know what it's like to be an independent maker who's really just trying to make things happen. And really running hard every day, you know, waking up at 5 a.m. Uh, before my kids got up and, and you know, working before they got up and then going to my day job and then coming home and putting the kids to bed and working after they went to sleep. And I, I know what it's like. And it's, it's a little bit difficult to tell if all of that was really necessary. Uh-huh. Because... This isn't just about slowing down twice a year. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. But it's really about, we, we set out to build a calm company. And, you know, John and I were both in our late 30s when we started Transistor. I'm 40 now. We'd both been in tech for a while and had worked, you know, those 50, 60 hour weeks. And frankly, we were just tired. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we wanted something different. So if we were going to build a company, we knew that this time around, it had to be different because the, the old way had burnt us out. So yeah, those slowing down every year helps. But it's also just about having enough margin, enough financial margin, mm-hmm. enough time margin, uh, just overall margin in the company to be able to have a slower pace. When the pandemic uh, happened, uh, you know, my co-founder, John, he he just had a hard year. And he was like, I'm just, I can't do this right now. I can't really hustle right now. And it was so good to be able to say you know what that's fine let's just slow down let's just let's just really gear down and take care of ourselves right now and um yeah it it feels amazing (laughs) to be we feel so fortunate to be in this position and compared to the old way like the old way i thought i had my freedom because i you know i had I had managed to quit my day job in 2016 or whatever it was. But um, every month, you know, I was still like uh, having to come up with more income for to, in order to live. And there, it was just like, uh, there was nothing recurring about the revenue. Every month it was a new launch or a new partnership or uh, a new sale or, whatever. And uh, SaaS for, you know, indie makers is nice. Recurring revenue is nice because every month you don't have to recreate all of your revenue. It's, it's still there from the month previous. So I would say this has made a enormous difference in our lives. Now we have this freedom and this flexibility and this calm that we didn't have before. Right. Uh, to anybody listening, I can just suggest you guys go and see Justin talking about the, the story of Transistor and what happened before and what he briefly mentioned, having to write the next book, have this big surge and then see it, you know, uh, not necessarily flatline, but not stay up to that level. Justin has been speaking about this countless of times, so we will repeat this over this AMA. And one point I wanted to bring up based on what you just said, just it. it's I, I think it's really down to uh, the dividend you were uh collecting 
based on the decision you made a couple of years ago, which was to to build a calm company. That, that's down to what you mentioned that John's situation over the pandemic uh, forced this. So mm-hmm. uh, uh, um, you are fortunate, and I, I really appreciate you calling out the the luck and the fact that uh, you know it, it, bringing out these caveats or these uh, points of bringing this up to people's attention but i think it's also down to this dividend you were uh reaping based on your decision so to speak Mm -hmm. yeah there's so many factors that that uh contribute to a success but and i think luck is a portion of that and luck is like this blanket term we used to describe all sorts of things um you know most of my luck actually had already occurred by the time I was born, right? So I was born in 1980. That Hmm. uh, really contributed a lot to my luck. I was born in Canada. I was born to, you know, the family I was born to. um, And uh, a lot of who I am and a lot of what got set in motion just by those factors, that's most of the luck. Uh, Now, there's certainly been other kind of lucky factors along the way, but those have been more conscious, meaning uh, getting out there and being in motion, you know, contributed a lot to being able to build Transistor. Starting a blog in 2008, starting a podcast in 2012, going to meetups, going to conferences, meeting people, reaching out, um, you know, trying just being in motion, doing things, launching little projects, building relationships. I I met John at a conference in 2014 and, uh, you know, we became friends. And then I I made an effort to stay in touch with him while, you know, in the, in the years between that meeting and us launching Transistor. So there's a lot of factors and, it's kind of like layers in your life that you just keep adding to. And certainly if all you do is play Xbox, um, that, and that's it. And you never get out of your house and you never meet people and you never launch anything and you never practice skills. Uh, you're, you're, you're going to have less of a chance to build something successful. The success is really built on the foundation of luck uh, but after that, there's a lot of potential for us as individuals to get out and build our own momentum however we can and really practice the right things. I, I use this metaphor of surfing. You know, if I just go out and mm-hmm. try to surf today, I, I, I'm probably not going to catch any good waves. But surfing is about being in the water. Surfing is about practicing fundamentals. Surfing is about uh, learning to paddle, learning to recognize the size and shape of good waves, learning to recognize where the good spots are. And the only way to do that is to get out of your house and drive to the beach and start working on all that stuff and do it every day. And so uh, I think luck is a, a factor, but there are kind of conscious activities we can do that uh, will increase our chance for success. I was I was smiling uh, when you mentioned surfing earlier because I have this page in front of my on my laptop, which I wanted to mention, but uh, we just passed the subject. But it's a nice segue. What you were saying earlier about picking the industry, I was going to direct people to your article called "Businesses Like Surfing." That's JustinJackson.ch/surfing, uh, where. It really stood with me, so I'm not mentioning it uh, just because we briefly uh, touched upon it, but because it stood with me after I've read it. Um, you always hear about this thing of choosing your industry or tailwinds or stuff like that, but I really like it when I can ha- hear a new idea or maybe even the same idea, but I have a bite-sized thing that I can keep in my mind. And this thing of surfing or uh, I skate to where the puke is going to be, not where it's been. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the bite-sized bit that I that I got from your take on the choose your industry wisely uh, piece of advice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, although I, I'm not a fan of that Gretzky quote. 
<laughs> but it's up there. It's, it's, it's as soon as you start the article, it's the first highlight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in, in some ways, I'm, 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 I'm arguing it's a bad metaphor because the, a lot of people take that, that metaphor, that Gretzky metaphor, to mean uh, yes. I've got to somehow discern or intuit what's going to be big in five years and then um, build that right. now. And right. I think it's actually the opposite for bootstrappers. If you're not funded, you, you're, you, you don't really have the luxury of building something that doesn't have established demand. And my, my theory is that uh, 99% of bootstrappers should be building for demonstrated demand, existing demand, what people are searching for or trying to solve right now, as opposed to five years from now or 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Stuart at Slack has this blog post about we don't sell saddles here. And the whole idea with Slack was we're going to build something that's going to revolutionize work. And I, I wrote a, uh, a response to it saying bootstrappers do sell saddles. <laughs> like hmm. we, if, if, uh, if cowboys want sa saddles and, and there's demand for it, that's what we should be selling. We're not trying to create the waves. We're trying to ride them. Ride them. <laughs> yeah. So I like that. I like how you, both with this uh, Gretzky quote and the thing you mentioned earlier, advice has to be contained in an interval. So what you said earlier that, you know, may be long to somebody who's listening, but very important caution, cautionary tale of you taking a break because you can afford, because the business uh, can afford it for you, is I guess the other end of the interval for this work-life balance uh, topic, which has been kind of consumed, I would say. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, I like this, uh, this range, this interval you're giving to this piece of advice of so business like surfing, but be mindful of this puck uh, quote. And mm -hmm. yeah, it just balances it for me. Just, uh, I was just thinking out loud. Um, to, to the people listening, I will just go on with another question and then feel free to click the mic button in the, the request button in the lower left corner so we can get some questions from the audience for Justin. Um, let's see. I, I want to, I guess we're going to get in and out of podcasting and bootstrapping because those are the two main topics. But um, to make this segue from uh, general life abstract stuff to more practical, talk to us, if you will, Justin, on the simplicity of Transistor.fm. So we know it's a healthy business. And the website is quite simple. It gets the point across. I loved your uh, article, your take on how to start a podcast and some other guides. Uh, is it simple on purpose? And should we take note of that? Or are you due for an update? And <laughs> it would be wrong to take these these notes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think for most bootstrappers, again, it depends on what you want. So... John and I were older when we started Transistor, <laughs> late 30s. I'm in my 40s now. I just don't have the energy to do a lot of things. Uh, and we purposefully wanted to keep the company small for right now. So working backwards from that, that goal, if we're going to keep things small, it means our tech stack has to be simple. It means the product has to be simple. It means that anything we start, we need to consider because we know we're going to need to maintain it. Any feature we add, any complexity we add, uh, it's not just adding that complexity to the app, it's adding that complexity to our lives. And we started this business to serve customers, for sure. I think we do an incredible job of serving customers. I think we give some of the best customer support. I think we are truly invested in our customer success. But at the same time, we built this business for us. And we wanted to build a business that would give us a good life. And so uh, simplicity is kind of key to that, to all of that. Um, and uh, in our industry, 
as an example, there's something called dynamic ad insertion, which allows you to set kind of markers in your audio and then have ads programmatically added to your, your podcast audio. And if you read any of the industry articles or even pieces in the New York Times, everyone's saying this is the future of podcasting, this is the future of podcast monetization. And you know, you might think, well, this is gonna be a necessary thing we need to build. And we considered build, building it, but then we looked at the cost and it would just add an incredible amount of complexity to our app. And then we went out and actually looked at podcasters and observed podcasters and asked how many, you know, what percentage of our customers and what percentage of podcasters would truly benefit from this? And the truth is you need, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of listeners to truly benefit from dynamic ad insertion. And that's for 99% of podcasters, that's not, a, that's, that's not their situation. And so we made a conscious decision not to build that, at least for now, because we didn't want that complexity. In the same way, I just had a, <laughs> I had a call with a, a big company that people would recognize. And uh, <laughs> he's, he's with head office, you know, Fortune 50 company. Yeah. Uh, they have 1,600 divisions. They already had customers with us and they want to negotiate a big contract with us and we will become the exclusive podcast provider for this, this company. And he's like, okay, so after we get done with this call, I'm going to get on the line, you know, your legal team can talk to my legal team and your ops team will talk to my ops team. And then uh, my purchasers will talk with your people. And I was like, hold up. <laughs> We are it's just four of us. I said, they, this is an incredibly small company. I said, right at the moment, there's only, there was only two full-time people working on it. And he kept pushing like, oh, well, you should think about like, he was surprised, first of all. He couldn't believe that we had reached our scale. He's like, you're consistently one of the top five companies, podcasting companies I see online. <laughs> and he was just surprised. And I basically had to be honest and say, we're not going to, we're, if, if a deal with you is going to mean, it is going to need an ops team and a legal team and all these other folks, like I'm going to need to triple or quadruple the size of my company just to do this deal. I, I'm not interested. And those kind of deals and that kind of process is my least favorite thing <laughs> in the yeah. world. Like going through all that due process and paperwork, I, I do not like it. And it would add so much heaviness and complexity to the business. So I, I said, you know, this could mean, sure, 1,600 new accounts, but we're just not interested. And so, yeah. So, sorry to interrupt, but I, I need to do it because I'm very curious. What made you say, sorry, no, and not look? in a nicer way, nicer, I'm going to put it, we're just two people, this is the kind of company we're making, take it or leave it. Why turn them away? Oh, because those kind of deals necessitate a whole machine. Like, it's not mm. just that we're not speaking the same language. It's, it's, it's just a, it's a completely different world. The, the, gulf, the gulf between self-serve and enterprise is massive. There's like really no middle ground. I, I've seen Ben at Tuple uh, do a little bit of this, but even they have seemed to to struggle with it. They they you know he's trying to hire a head of sales right now, yeah. And it it can work, but uh, I just for us and especially for this deal with that kind of company, like Fortune fifty companies, they're just so massive that. You know, in order to do deals, you really need to have the, the underlying infrastructure to and, and uh, sales process to accommodate them. You need to accommodate them. And I and as an independent SaaS, I I'm, have the freedom to say, no, 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 I don't need to accommodate you. This business is also for me. I don't serve you. This business is partly to give me a good life. 
And so I'm going to say no, because I don't want that in my life. I don't want more headaches. I don't want somebody who's calling the shots over me and forcing me to do things I don't want to do or pressuring me to change my app or whatever it is, right? I don't want 10 meetings with lawyers. I want the life that I want. This is what we're building. He, he even offered to acquire us on the phone. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> like working for that company uh, would be not a good life, like compared to what we have right now. So it gave us the freedom. This is the whole benefit of starting yeah. an independent company. Yeah. This is why we do this so that no one else is calling the shots so that we have the, the leverage. This is like the only time in history. This is why I think luck is partly about when you're born. This is the only time in history where, you know, two, you know, a Canadian and a, and a guy in Chicago could start a company and have this much leverage to say no to a big company like that. To have uh, the leverage of search engine optimization, which allows Transistor to compete against companies 10 times our size and, and actually rank. Yeah. Two people can stand up to giants. And uh, it's, it's an incredible, in that sense, it's an incredible time to be alive. It's why I'm a big fan of the open internet. It's why I'm a big fan of open protocols like RSS, because I think these are the, the platforms that actually give independence, independent creators, independent business owners, leverage over big corporations. We, we, can, actually, we can actually carve out a life for ourselves independent of them. They don't call the shots. And so that, that's kind of what fires me up, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it's, e it's easy to say no to those people. That As opposed sense. to the old days, you know, I've done freelancing and consulting and everything. And, and you're just always kind of uh, pushing yourself to do things you don't really want to do because you need that client or you need that sale. Um, the, the beauty of the creator economy is you can, you can gain so much leverage as an independent or a small company that you can actually say no to those bad jobs. That makes a ton of sense. Just a quick comment, and then we're going to get Noah because he's been waiting a bit for his question. It makes me think of what the Basecamp guys, second time I'm mentioning them, because I know you know at least Jason, or I don't know if David as well. I, mm -hmm. I know you had some episodes. It makes me think of what they said a long time ago, and people re-mentioned uh, that over and over again. The fact that if you have a huge enterprise deal that is more than I don't know how much percent of your revenue you don't have a client you have a stakeholder in your product and mm -hmm. what what this person said on the phone with you that uh, making an acquisition offer I think that just reinforces their 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 idea mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah exactly and it, I think we intuitively know this right it, it, we in the indie SaaS community we always talk about platform risk like building on somebody else's platform has risks. And uh, to a certain extent, independent SaaS companies are always going to need to do arbitrage on bigger platforms, right? So even search engine optimization is basically uh, doing arbitrage on Google, right? Um, and Transistor uh, has some big platforms in our ecosystem, like Apple Podcasts mm -hmm. and Spotify. Uh, but the, there's a way to spread that risk out. So, um, you know, in Transistor, there's not just Apple. It's not just Spotify. It's also Google. It's also Amazon. There are multiple platforms who are all kind of uh, holding the, the, the tension, right, so that not one owns it. And that gives an independent company like ours space to operate and be profitable, uh, I see Derek Reimer in here. He has Savvy Cal, which is a similar thing, right? Uh, sure, he's building on top of Google Calendar and on top of Outlook, but you've got two, at least two giants there that are holding the balance of power. 
um, which is a lot different than building your app exclusively on Shopify or exclusively on Heroku, right? So yeah. there's different degrees of platform risk to a certain extent. There's always going to, that's always going to exist for independent SaaS. Uh, but the best situation is when we can go in and do arbitrage on those platforms and, you know, kind of uh, get the good parts and, uh, uh, insulate ourselves from the bad parts as much as we can and yeah, uh, create these, these great independent businesses that megacorps wouldn't be interested in because they're just too small of an opportunity, but are really, uh, you know, as far as independent business goes are incredibly profitable and, um, you know, can have really great margins. That makes sense. No follow up from you on this one because I really, I'm really curious to hear Noah's question. So welcome, Noah. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks. Yeah, I just kind of had a follow up question, Justin, to kind of what you were talking about with the saying no. Like, I, I can see how you can say no to like enterprise. Like, it's kind of a, a different track and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm curious, like, how do you say? How how do you handle saying no to feature requests and things that like. Uh, would maybe fit in kind of what your your wheelhouse is already um, with just, I, I think something I kind of struggle with just because I, in my personality, I like to say yes to people. I don't like to let people down. Mm -hmm. I, I know you, you guys do kind of the wait and see kind of like feature prioritization. Um, but yeah, like how do you handle like saying no to people and not like, like you feel like the pressure of, oh, if I don't do these things, like I'm going to lose these customers or things like that. So I'm just, yeah, I'm curious how you handle that. Yeah, I mean, at the beginning, you definitely are, are more willing to say yes. So our, our first 100, 500, even 1,000 customers, um, we had more of a willingness to say yes and to make exceptions and to, you know, uh, uh, yeah, be be more be more willing to maybe do things we didn't want to do, but uh, the the momentum in the market is really your savior there, because if there's a lot of momentum, there's a lot of people waking up every day looking for a product or a solution like yours, um, then eventually that momentum can carry you to a point where, you know, in our case we have over five thousand customers, and. Uh, most of whom are paying us $19 a month. And so we have this freedom to say no to big companies because then we can do the math like, okay, sure, uh, getting 1,600 new customers, new accounts would be great, but what's that going to mean for our lives? What's that going to mean for you know, the, the balance and calm and margin we have right now? And the other thing I think we did early on is we, we articulated what we wanted as founders. So when there was, you know, when there's no revenue, we said, okay, but what do we want? Like, what's the dream of eventually we're going to be at a space where we can what? Like, what's, what's that going to look like? And for me, it was like, I want to be able to go snowboarding and not have to tell anybody. I want to be able to look outside and say, oh, it's, you know, 95 degrees. I want to go to the lake. And with that in mind, now I can, every decision that comes up, I can say, does this take me closer to that or further from that? And again, maybe because I'm a, I'm a bit older, I, I just know what it's like to constantly say yes and what, what that eventually results in. And it's, it just doesn't give you more life. If you're always saying yes, and you're just stacking up the list of obligations you have, um, it just squeezes out all the good parts of life. And I wanted to, I didn't want that anymore. So there's a transition period. At the beginning, you're more willing to say yes. You're more willing to go the extra mile for customers. But keeping in mind where you eventually want to end up, I think will help you make those decisions and help you say no. Would you? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. 
would you sorry a follow up from from me would you call that lifestyle design just like people do it this call it these days on twitter justin yeah i guess yeah i guess it's lifestyle design um i, I it's basically about deciding what you want i have a friend who loves doing these big enterprise deals he's talking to one of the biggest retailers in the us right now And he just gets fired up by, you know, having all these meetings, jumping on planes, flying to big cities, building a big team, raising a bunch of money. And he's about the same age as me. And he just is fired up about it. He wants to move to a big city and, you know, do all that stuff. And so for him, that's the ideal. For me, at this stage of life, I'm 40. I've got, uh, I have four kids. I have th one kid that just graduated and moved out of the house. I have three kids at home. I just want to enjoy, you know, these years I have while my kids are still home. And that means not adding too much more to my plate. And so, uh, and that was the dream from, you know, when I started. Of, of of having that life and it just took 10 years to get there sorry justin sorry to interrupt the, the last bit i don't know if for everybody but it disconnected a bit so we lost the last 10 seconds of what you mentioned oh sorry i, I got a call there yeah oh, I, no worries. i'm just saying uh for me it i've had this dream since 2008 and uh i've just been kind of steadily working towards it and so Um, it took 10 years. <laughs> it took 10 years between 2008 when I joined the tech industry and read um, Getting Real by 37 Signals hmm. and kind of catching this vision. It took 10 years of blogging, podcasting, building projects, making connections, releasing little products. And then event finally, I was able to get here. And my, my hope is that other people would be able to do it faster than I did which is one reason I, I'm, I always talk about this idea of the market and the category you go after being one of the most important decisions you make. Because I think that, that uh, not understanding that resulted in, you know, a lot of kind of uh, uh, half starts for me. That makes sense. Um, thanks very much for the question, Noah. Unless you have a follow-up, feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, for everybody in the audience, uh, once again, feel free to click the button in the lower left. That's for requesting the mic so you can ask Justin your question. Also, if for some reason you can't talk at the moment or you're maybe just a bit shy, feel free to DM me. I can be the voice for your question. You can obviously have it in text there. I'll read it out loud for you guys and we'll get Justin's answer. Um, since we don't have any request at the moment, I'm just going to be a bit, uh, uh, enact my evil plan of asking Justin for free advice. No, I'm joking. I'm not going to do that. Uh, Justin, tell us a bit about some, maybe some creative podcast formats you've seen. Um, you've mentioned this on a podcast the other day, not the other day, sorry. I was listening to it the other day. I think it was two years ago. But um, you, were, you were talking about how many of the podcasts that are going to be there are going to be really great, haven't been created yet. So talk to us if you've seen any creative podcast formats, bonus points if it's related to either SaaS or business generally. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's still tons of opportunity in audio. Um, I think there's still, even though there's tons of them, I think there's still lots of opportunity for the uh, two bootstrappers talking to each other format. Uh, I know there's lots of those shows. We have a lot of those shows on, on Transistor. But for people building independent SaaS, those have uh, an ancillary benefit, which is getting on the phone every week and speaking to someone who's either your co-founder or someone also trying to start a SaaS company creates its own momentum, even if there's not that many people listening. This is uh, something that, that uh, the folks at Gimlet mentioned with their startup podcast. They said, you know, there's just something about getting on the mics every week that creates its own momentum. 
your your journaling, your experience as you go along. But just like speaking to somebody or talking about your experience has this reflective nature to it that's helpful. Uh, being on the microphone for some reason uh, encourages you to be a better version of yourself. It just it, it you just kind of bring yourself up, and it puts you in a different mind space that John and I certainly found helpful when we were building Transistor. So I think those kinds of podcasts, starting a podcast, not necessarily to grow a big audience, but just to have this weekly practice of you know recording a conversation and putting it out into public, putting it out, yeah, in public. Uh, is really helpful. Talk There's, to us. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, talk to us a bit more about about this thing you mentioned, which I've heard before you say on a podcast that uh, when the mic is on, when that green light, when the light turns green, that's somehow the best you coming to speak. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I don't know what it is. It's it's because it's half performance. Like there's a little bit of performance you know that it's not the exact same as having a personal conversation. For instance, there's some things that John and I talk about in private that we would never talk about on our podcast. But at the same time, there is something personal about it. And, and sometimes, for example, huh. it, it allowed me to confront issues that maybe I would have been a bit shy to confront in private, but... Uh, you just kind of, when you're on the microphone, you feel this freedom to bring it up because you know it might make good radio. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one like one thing that John and I had to kind of confront, or I felt like I had to confront, it was bo bothering me, <laughs> is in our partnership, you know, I get a ton of attention. Uh, I'm on Twitter all the time. I get... I'm on podcasts all the time. And uh, even at conferences, like I just love, you know, being in a big group of people and holding court and, you know, uh, performing. And I was like, I wonder if John, I wonder if John uh, is upset about this. Like, is he upset that I'm getting so much attention? Interesting. And so I, I, I was just too nervous to bring it up in private, but on the podcast, I was like, well, let's do it. You know, we're, we're recording. This will make some good radio. So I just asked him and we were able to have this great conversation about that. And it turns out he's, he's like, dude, I am fine to not get that kind of attention. He says, the, the things you do uh, sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I told him I was doing this Twitter Spaces and Reddit thing today, and he's like, uh, "That sounds like the least amount of fun ever to, to him." So you know, it just became this this really positive attribute of our partnership. You know, it's the the yin and the yang of our partnership. Uh, I really enjoy this stuff, and he doesn't. And we were able to kind of confront that issue on, you know, on the podcast. That makes sense. That makes, and I'm glad it, it turned out well. And it was not only bad, but it was the perfect match. Something you you didn't foresee in this uh, in this question. Uh, mm -hmm. Once again, reminder to people: request button, lower left corner. Click that. Get on the stage, quote unquote. Ask Justin a question. Uh, I'm just gonna carry on with something else. So, as part of the research I was trying to do for this. For this, oh, there we go. We have somebody who wants to ask a question. I'll keep mine for later if we have time. And Justin, just a quick one. We're almost one hour into this. Do you have to go or should, can we go beyond one hour? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's keep going. The, the one secret to any live thing, live stream, Twitter spaces, whatever, is the longer you do it, the the generally the the better they go. <laughs> We're going so Joe I'm, Rogan in here then. We're going three yeah, hours I, at least. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine to keep going. All right, there we go. Uh, we got Darko, uh, bracket zero to users. Feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, hey, guys, can you hear Hello. me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. 
So, Justin, I, I know that SAS is your area of expertise, but I wanted to ask something related to marketplaces, if that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, I know that marketplaces are extremely hard, but I am taking this chance of developing a side project uh, in a local market, basically like a real estate marketplace. So, I, I know the demand is there. I know the supply is there. I know there are several uh, general purpose sites. So basically, I'm trying to do something like Zillow just for a specific country. But, you know, uh, always there's always the chicken and the egg problem. So, uh, mm-hmm. uh, so I got this idea of basically starting with a newsletter. So let me explain, like, uh, basically... Uh, people that are trying to find an apartment, I'll tell them something like, hey, we'll find you the best deals for uh, real estate. And this works surprisingly well. But now, on the other hand, I cannot persuade the people uh, to lease their <laughs> apartments, uh, the ones who rent houses. So I was wondering if you have any tips regarding this particular use case for finding persuading supply of to join the marketplace so this may be similar to you know like uh, you're a digital marketing agency and you're trying uh, you know uh, to tell people hey i can help you promote your business i'm the person for for the job so and mm-hmm. your general opinion on like marketplaces and building them bootstrapping them in a small market so that's my question thanks Sure. I mean, the rules are always basically the same. So how much momentum or demand, what customers are searching for this already? Uh, I think the, the honest and difficult question every bootstrapper needs to ask is, how do I know what evidence is there already that I can see that people want this? And uh, to be really honest with yourself about that, what evidence do I see that people are actively trying to solve this problem, actively searching for this? What evidence do I have that there is a, an angle in this market that I can take advantage of that I'm uniquely uh, suited to um, that will give me a chance to paddle out and catch this wave? And uh, part of that equation, I think, needs to be what personal uh, connections do you have in that industry? What, uh, you know, what's your network? Who knows you and who do you know? Um, What kind of built-in strengths do I have? What built-in insights do I have already? And if if you don't have many, I would say you should pause and really get involved in that category or industry before you try to, especially before you try to build a marketplace, because it's already so difficult. And to get that initial traction, you're going to need to have a bunch of connections that you can reach out to in DMs and emails to say, hey, I've just launched this thing that I've been telling you about. Um, you know, can you, can you help me? Now, doing a newsletter can be one way to do that, um, especially if, Again, if you've got some sort of insight or experience in that industry that will give you a unique perspective or a unique take on it, um, understanding distribution channels, especially, (laughs) it it usually requires that you've been in that industry for a while. Like if you don't have an intuitive sense of what the distribution channels would be to find people, for example, for a newsletter, you probably just need to be involved in that industry more, like go to more meetups, conferences, online forums, uh, existing newsletters in that space, like really immerse yourself so that you have a good understanding of what's involved. And the mistake I see people make is they just do that too preemptively. Like they don't have any connections they don't have any unique insight. They don't have any strengths or uh, you know unique uh, unique takes on that industry or category. They have no experience. It's just going to be a lot harder 
um, to, to bootstrap that if you don't have some of those fundamentals. Thanks very much, Darko, for your question. Uh, one quick note for, we got Amari Deep up next, so feel free to unmute yourself. Then we got Mohammed, then Paolo, and uh, Robert has just requested I'm going to accept him now. Just one quick mention for the people asking questions. We just need to keep it 30 seconds or less, something around that time frame, so we can have time for everybody. Hello, Amari Deep, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear Welcome. me? Yeah. Hi, Justin. So hey. I had a I had a question like, you know, uh, I think it was kind of touched upon about, let's say, an acquisition thing. So like, how do you handle an offer of an acquisition? Uh, and like at what number you might start thinking that, OK, I might consider it. The reason I'm asking you is, see, uh, acquisition means that, you know, and I'm not talking about acquire. I'm really talking about like, a, let's say, a cash acquisition because mm -hmm. um, with that, that also comes with the fact that then you lose this business and then you have to find a new purpose. And that kind of takes time and like you have landed on Transistor now, I'm, I think after years uh, of, you know, being in this field. So landing on a new uh, purpose is sort of difficult. So like, does it occur to you that, okay, at this or let's say 10x or 20x of my revenue is the number that I might actually think of, you know, uh, considering the acquisition offers? Yeah. Uh, so in our case, uh, I have to also negotiate all this with my co-founder. Uh, so that's part of it. Uh, for us now, because Transistor, we've, you know, it took, again, it, for me, I've been trying to do this since 2008. And there was also you know, I, in 2016, I quit my job. And so for me personally, I want to, uh, in some ways, get paid back for all those years in the wilderness. <laughs> you know, all, the, all that, all those years trying to make things happen, some false starts, uh, some things that worked out okay, but didn't really give me a ton of margin. And so Transistor's now providing that. Any acquisition offer would have to be, you know, multiple multiples higher than what we're doing in annual recurring revenue. And we need to split that between two people. So, you know, for us, it's probably going to be at least 25 million, I'm guessing. Um, but just because to, <laughs> to, to go through that and then also to have to go work for somebody else and to give up our freedom and, Everything else that goes along with that, I, I think 25 million is probably the, the minimum. And um, yeah, that, it's, it, that kind of makes it easy. Uh, anything less than that for us is not worth it. It really depends on your stage of life. It really depends on how much profit your company's giving you each year. Uh, I know folks that have sold newer SaaS that you know got to maybe 5K a month in MRR. Uh, and, you know, they just wanted to sell it and move on. I think there's a, a big market for SaaS that, you know, these micro SaaS acquisitions that have gotten to, you know, $1,000 in MRR or $5,000 or even $10,000. Uh, there's a lot of folks that want to buy those. And you can make, you know, a nice little multiple on annual recurring revenue. Uh, at that scale, it's probably 2x, 2.5x, 3x annual recurring revenue is what you'd be looking at. Um, and yeah, if, if, if you don't, if you're not interested in those micro SAS uh, projects anymore and you want to sell, I, I would sell because uh, it makes sense to move on to something that you're going to, uh, yeah, be more excited about that you have more advantages in, et cetera. But once it's mature, like once you've built a successful indie SAS business, uh, the multiples definitely need to go up because if you've done it right, your life is pretty good and anything, uh, you know, anything they offer is going to have to be multiples above what you're, you're doing right now. Uh, I will say the one stress I have is that it's all going to go away tomorrow. So living with that stress, the nice thing about selling is that, if, you know, in North America, if I had $5 million in a bank account, that would definitely make me feel more calm. But the trade-off is I'd have to give up this company that I really enjoy working on. 
that's profitable, that ha- gives me a good life. And so right now I'm willing to take that, that risk that <laughs> it could all fall apart tomorrow uh, just because, yeah, the, the trade-offs aren't worth it. Thanks very much for the question. Really, really useful and really valuable answer as well. We've got up next Paolo. Welcome, Paolo. Feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll try and keep this short. Uh, I do have a, a question, or, or maybe uh, it's a little bit of advice. Um, but basically, you know, my personality um, is I like to dabble in, in various things. I, I tend to jump from from idea to idea. I just like to learn new things. But I also feel that it could be a hindrance at, at times. And that, that quote sort of, you know, jack of all trades and, and master of none sort of comes to mind. Um, but it's just sort of who, who I am. I just like, again, like to jump from idea and topic to topic. So for someone in, in that sort of who has that type of personality, like from a business perspective, do you think it makes sense to sort of hone in on one thing or just continue to do the things that I enjoy doing, although it's like sort of scattered mm-hmm. all over the place. Yeah. I can definitely identify with that. I I'm interested in so many things. Uh, if you look at my, <laughs> if you look at my history, like past projects, like, you know, I did uh, two podcasts, build and launch and mega maker, both, which were all about building, you know, mega maker was about building a hundred projects in a year. Uh, build and launch was about building multiple digital projects products and uh, launching them. So I, I'm in the same boat. I'm very much like that. And for a long time, I felt bad about it. But it's turned out to be an incredible strength. And that strength uh, definitely uh, became more evident once I partnered up with John. I think the, the for me personally, I don't know if this is wide, widely uh, true for everybody, but, you know, as a solopreneur trying to do everything myself, uh, that for me didn't allow me to kind of reach my full potential. It wasn't until I partnered up with somebody who really balanced out my weaknesses, uh, that I was, I felt like I was kind of fully able to be myself. And it's part of why I'm enjoying my life so much right now. Because John is an incredible builder, really talented, full stack developer. He can program, he can design. Uh, He's a good product person. I think we both kind of meet in the middle as product people, quote unquote. Uh, But we both have different, just different skills that we bring to the table. And it's been so enjoyable to be fully myself in this partnership. So one thing you might want to explore is partnerships um, because uh, I think folks like us that are good at a lot of things and, you know, want to wake up every day and work on something different, uh, we can be invaluable uh, in uh, a partnership. Um, this, is, this is actually one of my, the, the things I'm most thankful for now is increasingly I'm hearing technical founders say, ah, I really wish... I had a marketing co-founder and uh, it's, it's nice that uh, some of us, you know, uh, non-technical quote unquote people or people that are not super deep in one skill set are able to, um, <laughs> people are recognizing why those folks, folks like us can be valuable. And I felt bad about it for a while and then once I partnered up with John and I just saw how well it was working and how well it made both of us feel, um, now I'm, I'm just really appreciative of me being that way. The danger for people who start a lot of projects is you can get too committed to multiple projects at once and too committed to not abandoning projects when they need to be let go. And uh, I think I have a blog post on this. If you search justinjackson.ca, it's like how to know when to quit. I think that's a crucial skill for people who like to start a lot of projects. And um, yeah, I think it. in retrospect, uh, if you're really trying to build a SaaS, the, the key is to really explore 
opportunities that have demonstrated demand where you have some sort of advantage personally. And uh, I would invest time in discovering what those are, doing micro experiments to see where you get traction. And then, yeah, exploring this idea of finding a co-founder that can really complete you. Justin, the article you mentioned earlier, is it this one, the Freedom Ladder, or am I just looking at the wrong thing? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's okay. I think it's okay to move on is one. Oh, and okay, because I, I, I was trying to find it real quick so I can share it in the, in the pinned thread. So I'll do my best after this, uh, this thing. Uh, we're going to have Robert, but a quick reminder to everybody, if you guys can't speak at the moment feel free to dm me your question i can be the voice for it i've said this before but just in case the new people who came into the room didn't hear it um yeah i can pretty much be the voice for the question for any reason robert let's have your question feel free to unmute yourself welcome hey cool thank you for 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 doing this um first of all to reply to the previous person i'm exactly like that too i have a million different interests um, and just for me personally, I found that that's been a huge positive just because as soon as something does actually work, it really, really works and it makes it obvious when, when things are going well. So, um, for example, I had a hard time with getting Twitter followers. I, I wrote a book about ADHD. And then as soon as I went on to TikTok, I had, I got 50,000 followers in like a month. So it just, it's like one of those things where like, it, it's bad because it doesn't let you focus for a long time, but then all of a sudden you try so many things that one thing really does stick. So that, that's just my two cents about that. But um, Justin, uh, the question for you I have is how many hours do you work per week? What's an average work week for you? Mm, right now it's probably, probably averages out to five or six hours a day, uh, five days a week. Uh, at the beginning of Transistor, when I was still like working on old projects to provide an income and working on Transistor at the same time, I was probably doing, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 hours a day. Uh, and then, you know, the old, again, I don't know, it's hard to tell how much of this experience is, should be replicated, but, you know, in 2000 you know, starting in 2012 and 13, when I was working on side projects and going to my day job, I was doing that whole wake up early 5 a.m. and put in a couple hours and then go to work for eight hours and then come home. Um, so it's evolved over time. But these days, it's generally uh, five, probably five, six hours a day. Although you might get a different answer if you talk to my spouse. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's my that's my sense. It's 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 definitely way less hours than when I was working full time job, and definitely way less hours than when I was like really trying to figure things out. I think I think one thing we've discovered, uh, and this has been replicated by the way with my other friends that are doing well in business, like Adam Wavin, uh, Ben Ornstein. Uh, I've asked them too. And once, once you get an independent SaaS kind of up and if you've designed it to have margin, um, the, I don't know any of those folks that are working uh, more than eight hours a day generally. Um, so, yeah. As, as, as a follow-up, what would stop you, Justin, from uh, reducing even that five to six hours a day? Um, workload you have right now or different number if we ask your spouse <laughs> um yeah i mean uh so we we just took one step towards this because we hired helen riles to do uh customer success for us full time so we still do john and i still do a little bit of customer support but way less uh so that was one um action that you know allowed us to have even uh, more flexible time. Uh, I don't know. I really like a lot of this stuff. <laughs> like I like showing up and uh, doing stuff like this. I like waking up and thinking about, you know, what search terms I'm going to go after, what videos I'm going to record that day, what product uh, ideas John and I are going to shape. Uh, so as long as that's still engaging, um, yeah, it feels worth doing. 
I, I definitely want to try to minimize the stuff I'm not as good at um, and the stuff that doesn't give me as much life. There's always going to be some of that that's necessary. Uh, you know, we have to do taxes and paperwork and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I just enjoy it. I, I like I like doing this stuff. I like walking down to my office every day downtown and going for a coffee, hanging out in this co-working space. So if that's work, then I want to keep, yeah, I want to keep doing it. <laughs> and then I I feel like I already know the answer you're going to give, but I'm going to ask it anyway, maybe uh, for the chance of bringing a good answer, a very good answer out of you. Let me ask you this, this question in a direct manner. What would stop you from downsizing your, it's not what would stop you. Why don't you do this? Downsize the hours you would spend on Transistor because as we mentioned earlier, you've managed to grow into a calm company and get onto that treadmill of let's build an even bigger thing so that if this got this much in ARR, I want to get 3x or 5x or whatever. Talk mm -hmm. to us about your mindset that keeps you away from that. Uh, I guess treadmill is the best way to put it. Sure. I mean, I have been thinking about how I can diversify uh, my risk. And so right now, the risk is I really have all my eggs in one basket, and that's transistor. Um, and so I've just been slowly, you know, making progress in that. Um, so I, I've been pretty open about this, you know, after, uh, you know, had kids young, and really, anything I made year after year went to my family. And I didn't have a lot of extra money to do investing or retirement saving or any of that. And so that was the first step I took as soon as we had financial margin in Transistor. I started investing. I started uh, contributing to my retirement savings plans. Uh, I became curious about what other founders do to, you know, diversify their risk. And what I'm exploring now is um, investing, doing a little bit of angel investing. And by a little bit, I mean, I'm, I'm investing in one founder and really taking it slow and, um, you know, working with them, mentoring them on uh, launching a new product, but, um, you know, the, the transistor is still a great business and I want to keep, I want to stay as focused as I can on this. And then just on the side, when I have time, um, invest in other things and kind of, you know, spread out, um, the kinds of things I'm invested in. And that founder you mentioned earlier is, uh, Joshua Anderton from Upscribe, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We just talk to us a bit about it. the talk to us a bit about the was it a mistake release uh, last night or a couple of days ago when uh, <laughs> that Mega Maker trailer went out? Yeah. Uh, no, we we had planned on doing it. I just didn't realize it was going to auto tweet. I was like, <laughs> I was trying to 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 you know cue things up the right way. But yeah, I had this podcaster called Mega Maker Forever. I, that was my first paid product was the Mega Maker community. Started in 2013. It's been going since then. Uh, Joshua Anderton's been a member there forever. And uh, we thought it'd be fun to chronicle his, this new project on the Mega Maker podcast, which already had, you know, a bunch of people subscribed. Because really the most, like narratively, the most interesting part is building the company from zero to you know in josh's case to the point where he can provide for his young family and that really fires me up as someone who struggled uh to provide for you know a young family for a lot of years i have a soft spot for uh parents who are entrepreneurs hmm. and so it felt like a good opportunity i i really like him. He's uh, super talented, reminds me a lot of myself, except he's just more talented. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it felt like that would be a fun journey to share because every journey is unique in the same way that John and I shared it on Build Your SaaS. We're now going to share it on the, the Mega Maker podcast. Yeah. 
Uh, you just mentioned you have a soft spot for parents who are entrepreneurs. I've got a very good segue in here. Uh, we got a question from somebody who can't talk because the baby's asleep. Uh, mm. His name his name is Ian Kos- Kosnik. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's uh, J A N K O S U T N I K. The Twitter handle. So Ian or Jan says, uh, "I'm at the state of my life where I made a career change." Got a developer job, lost it due to the pandemic, and I'm playing with the idea of starting a SaaS because I, like Justin, am in my 40s and priorities have changed. Have a, I have a lot of interests, but the question is, should I follow Rob's stair-step approach and start with a single product, and in brackets, having trouble to decide what to create? I guess that's a side question. Or should I research the markets uh, I'm interested in and start with uh, SaaS from scratch? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is such a hard question because I really empathize with where they're at. There's one thing that doesn't get talked about very much in, you know, indie creators or bootstrapping or whatever, is that when we talk about self-funding a company, um, having a bunch of money in the bank really helps. Now, you don't want too much. <laughs> you don't want too much runway. There's, again, there's a tension between, you know, what you need. But um, the more stress you have when you, when you start building something, the harder it is going to be to just make it. Your biggest risk is that you're going to go broke before the company is able to get traction. And if you listen to early episodes of Build Your SaaS, you can hear this tension with me because John's working a full-time job and his stress was time. He'd work a full-time job and then come home and work on Transistor. I had already quit my job in 2016, but I was investing so much time in Transistor and very little on my old business. And financially, it was a stress. And I didn't have uh, even six months um, you know, runway in my bank account. In, in if if I could have, if I could have, the best I think would have been to have one to two years of runway, just because it. You can really hear me thrashing in some of those early episodes because uh, it's just nothing is happening fast enough. Even though in retrospect, you know, we we launched officially August first, two thousand eighteen, and by the following year, August first, two thousand nineteen, we were both earning a full-time income from Transistor. But when you come home every day and you see your bills and you know, you've know you got mortgage and you've got kids to feed, it's just stressful. And so it's a hard question to answer because there's no easy way to, you know, like your individual situation, I don't know what it is. And um, the, un- unfortunately, the foundation you've set like what you've done up until now kind of does matter. How much money you have saved up, how many connections you've made, uh, how many, um, you know, what momentum you already have in a given market, uh, what advantages you've built up in a market. And so it, it's difficult in the same way that, you know, as a 40 year old man, it'd be hard for me to show up at the beach and start surfing uh, competitively because I'm going to com- be competing with these, these young 20 somethings that have been doing it since they were 13. Um, that doesn't mean that folks in our forties, like we are, shouldn't try to do that. It just means we have to be aware that, um, and careful. And, uh, it's probably going to mean you're not going to have as much resources to do exploration And um, honestly, like if there's a certain industry that really interests you and you don't have a built up advantage in that industry, you don't have some connections, you don't have a unique perspective or a unique take on that category, I would try to get a job in that category first to give yourself some baseline income so you're not stressed out. You can gain a bunch of experience. You can make those connections and then you can go out and build your own thing. Okay, this moment here, can I ask? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, one question I wanted to check with you about was uh, your process of finding the co-founder. You said you know mm -hmm. uh, you had a you you had a period in which you know you were a solo entrepreneur, and then you know uh, you became you you actively sought a partner. What was mm -hmm. that thing that was pushing you to find that partner, and uh, how long did it take for you to realize that? Yeah. So. Uh, again, this is probably more of a personal answer. I don't know if there's like a kind of rote answer. Uh, I've been pretty public about this too. I, I was really depressed uh, and burnt out 2016, 2017. Didn't actually have much to do with business. It was personal issues. But uh, I hit rock bottom 2016, 2017. Like I, I was just as low as I've ever been. And um, it opened me up to this idea of like, you know, I, I was only able to go into my office like one hour a day if I was lucky. And I just saw all of my savings dry up. Um, and I, I realized like th there's this whole business I built was completely dependent on me and completely dependent on me showing up every day with a lot of energy and a lot of presence and um, you know, I, I had to kind of show up at 110% every day to make it work. And so that's the point where I was personally open to <laughs> finding a partner. I had, my ego had to be taken down a bunch of notches. Um, in terms of finding John, we've been friends since 2014. We would meet up in Portland every year for this festival called XOXO. And we had shared some really personal stuff with each other. We had been vulnerable with each other and had built up trust. And John came to me saying that he was thinking about building a podcast hosting platform. And I just recognized that that was an opportunity that I felt the timing was right. I felt like I could bring a lot to the table and I felt like John and I would be good partners. And so the, the uh, culmination of all those events happening uh, is what led to our partnership. Uh, we have a, a podcast episode about this on Build Your SaaS called How to Find a Co-Founder, Our Story. And um, we recommend things like, you know, you just got to, it's like you got to be in the water. You got to be paddling. You got to be uh, going to events, building your own projects, making stuff and telling people building long-term relationships um, and not with the expectation that like I'm going out to look for a co-founder, but building enough connections that eventually a co-founder relationship could uh, sprout and flower and um, at the right time. And so uh, it's, it's difficult kind of to plan for things like that, but you can have a practice of building relationships that can eventually lead to those kinds of partnerships. Okay. Uh, as a follow-up question, like, you know, in hindsight, uh, would you uh, would you ever build a co-founder relationship with a stranger? No. No, I would never build a co-founder relationship with a stranger. I, I don't even like to hire strangers. Um, you know, this is one reason we want to keep our team small is I, I really, I've, I've spent a lifetime cultivating relationships and um, I want to, that's the, that's kind of the, the and, and a diverse set of relationships, you know, of people all over the world, people all different ages, people all different skill sets, all different walks of life. Um, that's one thing I think I've done well is just continually cultivating relationships and um, for me personally, I would not build, I would not co-found a business with a stranger. It's just too risky. Um, so I, I mean, I think you can, that the dating period, quote unquote, can happen quicker, maybe, you know, you, maybe you can meet somebody and a year later feel like they're a good fit. But in this, it's very much like a marriage in, not in all respects, but, you know, huh. it, it, the commitment level is pretty like John owns 50% and I own 50% and I, 
you know, <laughs> we're tied to each other now. So uh, mm-hmm. it's, and, and, you know, there's the same, some days I'm grumpy and I'm an asshole to him and he has to tell me to quit being an asshole. And you just need this foundation to build that properly. I think uh, one really good podcast on this is um, talk therapy with Nathan Bashez and Dan Shipper. Uh, if you're interested in co-founder relationships, listen to that uh, talk therapy. It's really good. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, Thank you, Mohammed, as well. Thank you, Mohammed, as well, for your question. Justin, I just had a follow-up on, not this question, the previous one, but I, I wanted to let Mohammed has, have his uh, faster than mine. Um, you were talking about Transistor and the, the, the answer to the parenting bit and all that. In the in this history of transistor, um, it looked like it w- didn't work or it worked slowly for about seven eight months. I I've listened to these podcasts with you where you were talking about this this problem of the metrics look good, and to everybody you were talking with, with Jason Cohen, Nathan Barry, or whoever, uh, th- they were saying, "Look, I can't promise, but it looks like something good." But you just wanted it faster. And mm-hmm. it always felt to me like in this podcast, this there was this crevice of question of, did you change something once it started going up? Or was it just the same thing we said earlier, which was dividends you were reaping from some decisions you made those seven months before? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of things there. When you start something you are in a little bit of a fog um, and it's sometimes difficult to know if you're on the right track, are things going okay? What do I compare this to? What's the benchmark, you know? And some of these old stories, myths, legends that we refer back to, like the base camp story, um, you know, (laughs) if if that's what we're always comparing ourselves to, it's hard to know what's right and so Mm -hmm. a lot of that was an exploration of me going are we on the right track like i don't you know i i don't have a lot of energy and time to invest in something that is not a good idea and so i reached out to people like jason cohen at wp engine uh the base camp guys um Josh Pigford, Adam Wavin, Taylor Otwell, um, just folks, folks in Mega Maker, um, lots of folks, and just asked them what they thought to give me their honest opinion about our traction. And at the time, our our number, our revenue numbers were public, and so it was easy to give them the bare metrics link and say, "Okay, here's what's happening. Uh, what do you think?" And it was those phone calls that gave me the confidence to know that it was worth pursuing uh, because people said, you know what, like these fundamentals look good. Not as good as like, you know, like my friend Peldy started Balsamic and it was like, it was like a rocket ship. He, he, he describes it as being holding onto a rocket ship by his fingernails. Uh, it didn't mm-hmm. feel like that. But when I talked to him to get a gut check, his gut check, he said, Oh, this looks great. Like this, if this keeps growing like this, this is going to be a good little business. And, you know, our expectations at the beginning were if this could be, uh, I think we said if, if this could be a $50,000 a month business, that would be great for us. And that would be a success. And the people we talked to said, Oh yeah, this is, this looks like this could be a $50,000 a month business. So it felt like it was worth uh, waiting and continuing to work on the fundamentals. And, um, and again, having a network, uh, kind of a back channel that you can speak to. You know, I had investors that were telling me, you know, hey, we saw five other podcast hosting platforms launch this year, but you're doing way better than them. Um, so there were some, these, these people were able to encourage us even when it felt like, is this too slow or whatever? Um, Interesting. Getting, getting, getting feedback from people who had been there, especially folks like Jason Cohen, who, who is <laughs> is fine to be blunt, you know. <laughs> and yeah. he said, 
I, I really liked his benchmark. He said, you know, if you're in North America in in this kind of time frame and after two, two and a half years, you're not at 10K per month per founder, you probably want to rethink what you're doing. It, it's probably just not, there's not enough momentum there to really carry you as a bootstrapper. Because again, the biggest risk is you're going to go broke or get broken. You're going to burn out. So it has to happen relatively quickly. Yeah, I get that. And I, I think I mentioned to you as well in, in the emails when I was trying to set this up that uh, I was being filmed for your talk with Jason, which was a Periscope Live. I found that out recently when I re went over it. And in our AMA with uh, Ben Orenstein from Tupo, he, he mentioned Jason's uh, talk from MicroConf. But yeah, I, I, I appreciate as well about Jason that he can be blunt and direct, but at the same time, for some reason, it doesn't feel rude. Like it's not, it's blunt, but it's not blunt. How, how, mm-hmm. how did that feel <laughs> on your receiving end? Because in that Periscope thing, he was saying some stuff that if it wasn't for his tone and for seeing his face, you could say, oh, well, okay. But mm-hmm. you just took it well and uh, I'm guessing it helped you. Yeah, because I appreciated it. I appreciated the opportunity to get some blunt feedback. Um, and he's basically saying, listen, you should understand your market better than I do. I can't answer questions about whether podcasting is a good market or a bad market. You have to bring that expertise. You should be the expert on your category. Mm. But I can look at your numbers and tell you, uh, give you a sense of, you know, your momentum and how it looks and if there's anything to be concerned about here. And Josh Pigford did the same thing. He said, listen, I, I know a lot of other people's metrics and I can look at your, your churn numbers. I can look at your growth numbers and you, things are looking really healthy. If you just keep doing what you're doing, this will be a healthy business. And so, um, yeah, I, I, and maybe it was my age. Uh, you know, I, I just didn't want to mess around anymore. I wanted the, the cold, hard truth. And, um, and folks who are experienced should generally will say, we can't tell you whether this is a good opportunity or not, because you have to be the expert on that. You have to be the expert on whether or not this is a good opportunity, because (laughs) that's what an entrepreneur is. They are bringing some sort of insight, strength, um, advantage to bear in that category or that market. So that's up to you. But what we can do is review your numbers and let you know, um, you know, if you're on the right track. Yeah, because like, if it's not you, who is it gonna be? Like, you can't be a hundred percent sure, but it's, it's your job, really. Yeah, exactly. I see. Um, a bit of a, a side question: How did you uh, get in touch with, you know, and making these calls or this conversation in the first place with? Uh, the Jason, so to speak, Jason Cohen or Jason Fried from Basecamp. Was it uh, what you said earlier about making use of the, uh, I'll just summarize by saying leverage, making use of the leverage you've had with your past creations? Mm -hmm. Was it they just saw you were hungry and, you know, a a guy who really has his stuff together? What would you say was it? Yeah, in my case, it had just, it's about being in the water for a long time, you know, and doing things. So... Uh, it, it just, this is why it's difficult to sometimes give rote advice, like, well, you should just do this because there's layers and layers of experience that brought me to that place. Um, so I applied for a job at 37 signals back in 2000, 2010. Oh, wow. And they flew me to Chicago and I met with Jason and, uh, David and, um, that's how that relationship started. I ended up not taking the job, but we stayed in touch. And then I started a podcast in 2012. And because I had a relationship with them, they were some of the first people we, uh, Kyle Fox and I interviewed for Product People, our interview podcast. Uh, Product People was a big step, you know, just doing stuff, being in the water, uh, you know, trying to ride some little waves, making connections. Uh, it was just years and years of that. And um, once I had a connection with people, I just stayed in touch. I would, um, 
and that led to other opportunities. I got invited to speak at MicroConf. Uh, yep. Rob Walling asked me to speak at MicroConf in Europe. And that's where I met Peldy. And Peldy had been reading my blog. So there was like something established there. Um, so yeah, being, I, I actually don't know any independent SaaS people who weren't already, who hadn't already built momentum. Like, uh, Adam Wadden's in here in the room now. Like he, if you go back through his history, his stack, he just did lots of other things before Tailwind, and that kind of led to the connections. Uh, Adam actually had a huge impact on me because he, um, I was able to watch him launch his products, and he kind of opened up his books to me and showed me the, you know, what he was doing and the traction he had. That was like the key to my insight that the market actually drives most of your growth. Um, mm. Even though I think, you know, maybe on paper, I'm a better marketer than Adam. I, I, that's probably debatable. But um, <laughs> the market, like he was in, just drove so much of his growth. And he introduced me to Taylor Otwell. And uh, that had a huge impact on me too. Uh, also, I haven't told this story, but Taylor actually saved me because <laughs> when I was... <laughs> when I was depressed and, and making no money, Taylor invited me to speak at Laracon. And he, he gave me basically an advance for my travel expenses. And that paid my mortgage that month. <laughs> wow. So I, I like used that money to pay my mortgage. And then I knew I had some client money coming in the next month, but he gave me some cash flow to kind of survive. So yeah, all of those connections, the people you know, and the folks who know you is, that's a huge, can have a huge impact. Interesting. Uh, glad and you to... can't cultivate those relationships. You can't cultivate those relationships overnight. It's, <laughs> you're not going to cultivate that relationship by, by uh, you know, DMing somebody out of the blue and, and saying you should be friends. <laughs> like, it's just going to take time. You've got to be in the mix uh, doing things, releasing projects, uh, you know, uh, creating kind of these organic connections. Very interesting and very glad to have that uh, exclusive quote unquote story to use a tabloid <laughs> uh, wording in here. Find it out right here with Justin Jackson. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, glad to know Adam is in the room as well. Adam, feel free to to join the stage if you have something to add. I'm curious now if Tailwind was named like that. Uh, I suppose not, but I was just thinking this, so I need to put it out now because there, it was... Tailwind uh, definitely know. had some strong market tailwinds, yes. Yeah, there we go. We've got the, we've got the perfect <laughs> copywriting down. Uh, yeah, so uh, Adam, if you want to join the, the, the stage, we'll be happy to have you. But if not, no problem. We're moving on because... Uh, we've got a question from uh, Brendan Andrade in the DM, so I'll have to be the voice for this. Uh, Brendan says, Transistor has been taking hiring slowly, uh, which makes sense for your goals. Did I misread this? Transistor has been taking hiring slowly, which makes sense for your goals. I'm curious what you think about the hiring strategy. Sahil at Gumroad, Josh Pickford with Maybe Finance, and Rand Fishkin with Spark Toro have taken. They are all hiring part-time workers or contractors only. Are fractional employees the future for bootstrap companies? Uh, thoughts, thanks. And uh, uh, as a just an Adam from myself, I know Justin, you've you were on this podcast with uh, I don't remember the name of the podcast, unfortunately, but you were asking this gentleman whether adding customer support people is starting on contracting and mm -hmm. whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, this is a good question. And I think I've got a bit of a controversial take on this. So um, let me see if I can articulate this okay. So yes, hiring contractors can be a good strategy, especially, you know, at the beginning, Transistor had no money. And so um, we had enough money to hire some part-time contractors to help us with support. And, um, that was a good strategy for us because it allowed us to, you know, these folks were happy to have a couple hours a day of part-time work and it gave us a lot of flexibility uh, as a company. Um, we've also hired, you know, 
some people that we would never be able to hire normally because it'd be too expensive. So one of John's friends uh, got laid off at the beginning of the pandemic and we were able to hire him to do some development work for us as you know, he built our API and then he got hired. <laughs> he got hired by uh, a fang company, like, after the project for like way more than we would have ever been able to pay. So uh, I, I think hiring contractors is one approach and it's a good approach. The, the, the thing we need to be careful about is it's easy. It could be easy. There's a danger to taking advantage of contractors. And Uh, This is one of my concerns about this becoming kind of a new best practice is I don't know what, I don't know how, you know, Sahil does his hiring and how he takes care of those people. I don't know how Josh does it. I imagine, I don't know. I don't know how they're doing it. And I imagine they're doing an okay job, but it's very, there's a danger in taking advantage of people um, when they are contractors and part-time contractors. And, um, the way we've done it, so we hired Helen full time, and she's in the UK. Uh, she, her preference was to be hired as a contractor, and we just said, um, let's take what we would normally pay you as a salary, but then add thirty percent. I think is what we said for all the kind of employment related things. Like if we were in the UK and we had to hire her, how much would it cost um, as an employer? Because she's taking on all of those costs personally. Mm -hmm. So you have to take care of people uh, if you're going to hire contractors. And maybe that's not, maybe you can't be as generous when you're starting out and you're just paying people part-time, but you know, even our part-time contractors, um, as we've done well, we've paid out, uh, I think pretty generous bonuses. um, And those bonuses get paid out three to four times a year, uh, always at Christmas and usually in the summer and um, the other seasons as well. And um, to the point where sometimes we're paying out a bonus that's more than they've charged us for that month. Uh, So I I think the onus is on us to take care of people, to treat them well, to constantly review that agreement and make sure that it's, they're getting out of it what they want out of it and to not take advantage of people. But if they want that kind of flexibility um, and you're, you know, you're, you're being generous in the way that you compensate them or as best you can, I think it is a good approach uh, because it does make things more flexible. Like at the beginning of the pandemic, John and I were expecting like, well, maybe we'll lose 50% of our revenue and um, we didn't have to worry about, you know, firing half our staff because at the time it was just him and I. So we knew even if we lost 50% of our revenue, we'd still be okay. Uh, The opposite happened. We ended up growing during the pandemic. And so then we were able to be generous with the the part-time contractors we had and um, give them bonuses during a time that was difficult for a lot of people. That makes sense. And just a very short follow-up before we get Austin's question, who is a speaker. That 30% you've, you've added to um, uh, be there as a ballast for having Helen as a contractor, is it for like health insurance and the equivalents? Is it for the machine you'd be getting her? Or is it for covering the, the, the tax she would be paying? What would be covering that 30%? Yeah, yeah. So I... I... I just asked her what she would want. Um, like if we were going to hire her, like what are her costs as a, like she's a full-time employee for her own company. And so, yeah. you know, what are the costs kind of related to that? And um, so some of that is she's in the UK. So they're, like Canada, we have public health insurance, but usually you have to cover in Canada, you have to cover dental and um, uh, eyes like optometry yourself. And so that's included. Um, yeah. What she would be paying in tax, um, things like that. You, generally, like if you're going to hire a, a W2 employee, um, is that what it is? W2 or W9? I can't remember. W2. Um, it's going to, you, you, if you're going to hire them for, you know, 
$70,000 a year, you would add an extra 30% um, for kind of employer related costs. And so we just did that there. That makes sense. Thanks for, for clarifying that thing. Uh, moving on, Austin, welcome. Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, let's hear your question. Yeah. Hi there. Hello. Uh, hey. Uh, long time uh, listener, follower, and supporter of the Patreon, Justin. Um, just wanted to kind of ask about when building Transistor out, do you think that um, building in public helped kind of propel the company um, over time to get the success levels that you had? Or was it potentially uh, a combination of that and the network that you'd had grown through the past few years? Uh, what do you think kind of helped bring that forward into fruition? Mm -hmm. Is this Austin Loveless? Yes. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> Long time Patreon supporter. We, we read out the names of Patreon supporters after every episode. So it's nice to meet you, Austin. <laughs> Uh, Austin Levelis, Simon Bennett, Michael Sitford, Paul Jarvis, you know, we go through the list. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think building in public has a bunch of uh, advantages at the beginning because just right away, you've got a story and you've got a journey that other people can uh, join you on. And so, you know, You'll know this because you're you're a longtime supporter of the podcast. You know, we started the podcast. We don't know how it's going to end up. And there's something um, enticing about that. There's something that people want to be a part of. And so in the beginning, our Patreon supporters like you, like Patreon was more than we were making from Transistor, right? It was a um, that was that was how we were kind of paying our initial bills. And Sharing the story, sharing our progress opened a lot of doors. It made it easier to reach out to people like Jason Cohen and say, hey, like we're doing this. We're at the beginning. Here's our story. We're on this journey. Here's our numbers. Can you take a look? Um, so it opens a lot of those doors, even if you haven't built up a network previously. Uh, building a network helps. Um, this is kind of like, again, it's like the, the truth is like the more things you bring to the table, the stronger your position will be. So I did have an audience and I did have a network previous to this and they all kind of amplify each other. But um, definitely it's, it's a good way to go. And um, even like, so even your little act of supporting our Patreon from the beginning instantly gives you some leverage, like, cause you reach out to me and say, Hey, I'm starting my journey. Can you share it? And I would be totally keen to do that because you were so helpful uh, to John and I early on. So doing things beforehand, um, kind of setting, setting some foundation is helpful. And then, yeah, bu building in public gives you, um, it's one marketing tool that you can use to have people pay attention because it's interesting. Hey, I'm building this thing from scratch. I'm join me on the journey. Who knows how it's going to turn out, right? It's one of the reasons I want to take that approach with Joshua Anderton on the Mega Maker podcast because nobody knows. It could it could, it might not work, right? There's <laughs> the the future is unwritten. And so yeah, I think it's a great way to do that. Uh, I think Noah Prail and Ben have done a good job of that on the Product Journey podcast. Um, there's just sharing your story by its very nature will uh, at least create more likelihood that people will become invested in your story and will start cheering you on and might eventually, you know, be in a meeting with their boss and the boss says, uh, hey, we need some product, some podcast hosting. What do you recommend? And they <laughs> might say, well, hey, let's, let's do Transistor because I'm invested in that story. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thanks for supporting the Patreon. We, we've been donating uh, all of our Patreon um, money now, and it's been really fun to support other creators with uh, all, the folks, all the folks supporting our podcast. So yeah, thanks for being a longtime listener. 
Everybody go follow us, Austin right now. See what he's going to do <laughs> next. So glad to to see uh, some love sharing in here with some early supporters from from the from the Patreon account. Uh, as a quick follow up to Austin's question, Justin, could you for the people in the audience? I know you have a podcast episode on this, but just a quick mention. Could you tell people briefly why you and John stopped sharing uh, figures, revenues? You basically stopped building in public, uh, at least you know up to a degree. After about, I think it was 20K MRI, 30K, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, we stopped at 30K. And, um, you know, uh, Nathan Berry has an interesting take on this as well, um, because they've shared their revenue at ConvertKit the whole time, and they don't plan on stopping. Um, for us, it was just, we just became less and less comfortable with it. Uh, it was attracting the wrong kind of attention, <laughs> like attention from competitors who were using it against us, like they would copy parts of our business model. Uh, we were just giving way too much information away to our competitors. And narratively, in terms of a story, it's just building from zero to 30 is pretty interesting, but the stuff that happens from 30 on is just kind of the same stuff. It's just like, you just keep investing in the same stuff you kind of know what your channels are going to be. Um, you're just going to show up and kind of work on it every day. It's just not as interesting um, uh, narratively. And so the, we, we felt like it was a good time to, to stop sharing uh, kind of just for those reasons. Uh, those reasons alone made it, made it make sense for us. I was I was talking to Saba, who's Saba from V.io, who um, had an AMA as well. And basically, when we were setting it up, he was saying, "Look," and even in the AMA, he said, "This is one of the last times I'm doing this because they reached something like four million in ARR with some high growth." And he said, "People, at least in the bootstrap community, they're they're looking for the gal or the guy who reached 10k and MRR 5k maybe 20k mm -hmm. so he, he was echoing what you were saying but Justin a bit of pushback just for the sake of debating mm -hmm. uh, I understand your your point of view but w what about you know the Steve Jobs biography or the documentary about Michael Jordan I know I'm saying some massive outliers who have been romanticized and who have been, you know, put on a pedestal and all that. Mm -hmm. But there are stories about the early days. And I haven't watched the Michael Jordan documentary, but I know it covers his his peak performance. Or, uh, you know, maybe even even Saba. So I was saying Saba as well. Look, even after 4 million ARR, I would myself be interested because if my stars are aligned, and I, I hope I'm talking to everybody in the audience, if our stars are aligned, we... We'll get there, and we'd love to get that wisdom from somebody who's walked the 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 trail before. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you, how would you approach this? Yeah, I, I just think again, most of the lessons you can learn are at the beginning, uh, and I'm operating on a thesis here. The thesis is um, the thesis is that the the most important decision you make is which market or category you're going to go after. And so, you know, at the beginning, John and I had this hypothesis that podcasting had reached a tipping point, had burst into the public consciousness with shows like Serial, that branded podcasts were becoming more of a, a thing. So in addition to a company needing a Twitter account and a blog, many of them were wanting a podcast. That interest in podcasting was going to increase. Uh, that was our hypothesis and um, that it was a growing market. And proving that hypothesis out, it basically happens in the beginning from zero to 20, zero to 30, whatever it is, uh, based on our goals, right? We're not trying to build a billion dollar company. We wanted to get to a point of freedom. And so the, 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 that, the, the sharing your revenue, um, teaches you about whether or not that thesis worked and, you know, whether, whether or not we were right, but we basically proved that part. Now there are still lessons I think mm -hmm. we can teach, but they're not 
related to starting and going from zero to 30. Um, but it's just, it's just different. Once you hit that kind of baseline of MRR, then, you know, there's different lessons there for sure. But, uh, for someone starting out, it's not going to be as helpful. Um, and even honestly, like Nathan Barry shares his numbers. And I, when I was looking at his numbers, it was always like the first five years, but now like, what can I learn from looking at his numbers? Not much, <laughs> you know, there's just like, I can tell they're big. I can tell they've hired a bunch of people. I can, I mean, I can look at their churn and things like that, but it just doesn't apply as much. It's not, they're just in a different stage, a different category. I don't think we're ever going to be there. It doesn't matter as much, but the lessons you learn going from zero to 30 are mostly the same. The, the, the uh, principles that apply, especially as it relates to choosing the right market or category uh, are mostly the same. And so it makes sense to share there, but not necessarily later. I understand. Very, thanks for clarifying that. It makes sense now when you put it this way. So it's um, after a point, it's more of the same as, as they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, with, with regards to growing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's some wisdom about plateaus. Like once you hit a revenue plateau, how do you overcome that? Uh, but you can talk about that in more kind of generalized way. You don't have to be sharing all your revenue numbers at that stage. Yeah, I understand. Cool. Lovely. Uh, moving on, we got a question from Abdallah. Welcome, Abdallah. Feel free to un unmute yourself. Uh, hi, hi guys. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, Justin, I, I just have a question. I'm wondering how long, uh, how long did it take you from getting the idea to you to you having a a product uh, live and functioning, and also um, how long uh, did it take for between having the the product live to having you your first paid customer? Yeah. So again, this is a difficult question to answer because our situation is unique, just like every situation is unique. And <laughs> there's just so much in the backlog that happened. So a few things. One, again, I've been in the podcasting uh, community since 2012. John built the first version of Simplecast, uh, another podcast hosting platform uh, earlier in his career. Um, he started working on Transistor in 2017, uh, just kind of on the side and wasn't sure if he ever wanted to release it as a product. And it wasn't until like we started talking that we decided to actually go after it and make it, uh, you know, uh, a thing. And so the, 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 uh, you know, the underlying infrastructure for Transistor had already been kind of uh, built by the time I came along. We signed, we started talking December, 2017. We uh, signed our partnership documents February, 2018. And that month I used my audience and network community to get us some early access customers. So we had customers fairly quickly um, uh, because the, again, John had already done this before. He, he was able to build kind of a basic app pretty quickly. And so, yeah, by February, 2018, we had $33 in MRR. And then, uh, we launched August, 2018 at about $1,700 MRR. And then it took till yeah, uh, by August the next year, we were at 25,000 in MRR. So um, I would say, I, I usually divide our, our launch up into three categories. Uh, Pre-launch, where we were mostly accessing our existing network for early access users, just convincing people we already knew who had podcasts to switch to us. Uh, then we had our official launch on product hunt and all that stuff. Uh, which does create excitement and created kind of a burst of signups. And then signups kind of went down the next couple months. And then it was just really building up these traction uh, channels, like 
Uh, for us, it's search engine optimization, affiliates, and then our brand, which includes, you know, our community building, my personal brand, um, us sharing our story, us sharing our journey, being public. That's kind of the third category. And once we were able to really get those kind of uh, cranked up and working, uh, that's where we started to see an inflection point in trials and revenue that built up to um, August 2019. And we've basically grown steadily since then. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank I, you, Swala. I, I do think Go, it's, a, it, it's important. I, I, I hope what folks are getting from this is that that the you're always building on a foundation you're always building on what you've already done what you've already gained as skills who you already know this is why being in the water <laughs> learning to paddle uh just like being in motion gaining new skills being curious meeting people getting out there being active in forums um these are all activities that kind of get you to the point where you can do these things. One, one quote that really helped me in my depression and helped me kind of get out of that, that ditch I was in was James Clear. Uh, I got the opportunity to, to meet him um, at a retreat and he has this quote of every action you take is a vote for the kind of person you're going to become. And I loved that idea that every day I could get up, even when I was depressed and broke and everything else, I could uh, do a little action that was just a little vote for the kind of person I would become. And um, yeah, I've, I've really embraced that philosophy. And I, in retrospect, it really helped. So I can give you my numbers, I can tell you how our launch went. But it's based, it's, it's built on top of that foundation of, uh, you know, all the actions John and I took before. Lovely. Thanks very much for clarifying that. Uh, we got a follow-up question from the gentleman who I mentioned earlier, uh, parents who are also entrepreneurs. So uh, his, his name is Ian, if you remember. Uh, he wrote me a follow-up. Uh, yes, having savings helps to lower the stress about the money. To explain, I was in sound engineering industry for 20 years, so that is where I have most experiences. But the problem is that I'm no longer finding that area interesting. Maybe the best approach would be to find a market in that field, which brings me to my second question. Uh, thoughts, Justin, on adopting or buying another SaaS? Yeah, I mean, I've seen people do that successfully. Um, yeah, it, uh, it depends on, again, it depends on so many things. Do you have some sort of uh, interest in that category, a natural advantage, something you can bring to the table. And, you know, I have seen some people go into categories that maybe they weren't passionate about, but they had some sort of angle that allowed them to succeed. So, you know, like with John and I, I'm definitely probably more active in the actual podcaster community and the more, and the creator community. Like I get really fired up by that. And John is more, excited about building a great product, but he still had an underlying interest in audio and podcasting, and it does really help. Um, but at the very least, if you're gonna buy something, you wanna know that you've got some sort of angle that could make it uh, work. So with Ruben Gamez, for example, he's just really good at search engine optimization. And so, you know, he's probably the kind of person that could uh, evaluate an opportunity to buy a product by what, you know, can I win at SEO with this category? And just doing uh, winning at SEO really fires him up. And so that's enough to kind of get him out of bed and working on the product and moving it forward. So it depends. I've not done that yet, um, but I, although now that I'm kind of in this stage of life where I feel like I could invest in things, um, I am getting that sense of, you know, with Joshua Anderton, um, the, the idea that 
we're pursuing is going to be, it's, it's something that I'm excited about. Um, uh, I've joked with Adam Wavin that like, I get really fired up about parts of Tailwind. And if Transistor doesn't work out, uh, I'm going to go beg him for a job to work on Tailwind because uh, I think I could bring a lot to the table. I see lots of opportunities to um, grow that brand, to uh, connect, just to excel what they're already doing, to multiply what they're already doing. So if you have that insight or that feeling with something you're already involved in um, and you have the opportunity to buy an app, then sure, I go for it. Um, and if the fundamentals look good, that, that makes sense. I haven't personally done that yet. So I, I can only speak <laughs> kind of in terms of what I guess would happen. Lovely, Justin. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we got a question from Sid from the audience who uh, preferred not, not asking himself because he's a bit shy. Just a quick nod, Sid, that if you, I don't know, if, you, if you're a bit shy about talking in public or maybe your accent or something like that, feel free to, in the future, join. We're here to support you. Uh, but his question is, Justin, what metrics or feedback was it about, quote, tiny marketing wins, end quote, that made you decide it's not a sustainable business? Mm, yeah. So Tiny Marketing Wins was something I tried. Um, I released a course called Marketing for Developers that did, that did pretty well. It was what allowed me to quit my job. And so at that point, I was like, okay, what am I going to do next to kind of keep this going? I don't want to go back and get another job. And so I... Um, yeah, I, I started working on this thing called Tiny Marketing Wins. And the problem there was I built an audience and a following and some fans that were really kind of excited to see what I do next. And I launched it and I, I think I did $36,000 in revenue that month or something. And so I thought, whoa, like I just hit it. Like this is, this is, I've made it, you know? And it was, it was recurring, annual recurring revenue and, uh, I was over the moon. I thought, okay, well, I, I've achieved uh, a good little business here. The problem was there was tons of false positives in that business. And as I started to ask people why they signed up, you know, hey, what brought you, what's going on in your life that brought you here today? Like what motivated you to sign up for this tiny marketing wins uh, thing? And they were like, oh, well, I'm just a fan. I just wanted to see what you're doing next. Or, oh, I'm just curious. Or, oh, I wanted to build something similar. So I just want to see how you're doing it. And it was like, not, no one actually wanted <laughs> the product or not in the, not in the way I was presenting it. And so, um, yeah, I, I actually hung on to that one a bit too long. I tried pivoting it a couple times, partly just because I needed to pay my bills, um, but it, what it just all the signals there were that it was not a good business, and um, one thing that helped me <laughs> to to quit that idea was going to that retreat with James Clear, uh, Sean Blanc, um, Sean McCabe, a bunch of other folks, Chase Reeves, and they were just like giving me some blunt feedback, like ah, that just this idea doesn't feel like it's got the the legs to kind of get you what you want. And so after that retreat, I, uh, I wound it down. But yeah, it just wasn't there. Now, interestingly, I think the timing now would almost make that, that particular idea work better because now there's so, it's just normal, it's been normalized to pay for email newsletters and content like that, like subscription content. And so, now that that's become a norm, I think businesses like that can work. It sometimes bugs me because I see like uh, Kevin Conti has uh, like a product ideas newsletter. And, you know, I, <laughs> I did that 10 years ago, uh, but the timing just wasn't right. The, the wave, the size and shape of that wave wasn't quite there yet. It hadn't built up to the right point, but he was able to, you know, get to the beach at the right time and have the fundamentals to swim out and catch the wave at the right time. So it was partly the timing wasn't right. Um, I think those kinds of businesses are much more 
possible now because it's it's been normalized. Consumers have a place in their brain for subscription content uh, in the same way that now, we now have a place in our brain for Kickstarters. You know, that's a, an established paradigm and we don't have to convince people, you know, that it's a good idea because it's already a thing that exists. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of why I stopped doing it at the time. But I think ideas like that can work now at this point in time. Yeah, that makes sense. It's funny, it's interesting because Sid's follow-up question was exactly that. What are your thoughts on content behind a subscription? But you have uh, you were just going over that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, the, the key there is you need to build up a reputation in a community. And hopefully that community has some good traction and distribution channels. So Kevin Conti, uh, I think that's how you say his last name. I might be mispronouncing that. But um, his newsletter has been built uh, very much on, in indie hackers and that community and connecting with that community. So, um, yeah, that you, you need to have a build up a reputation and have some good ways of reaching people. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking for his, what that uh, newsletter is software ideas is his newsletter. Is it that newsletter that not, not newsletter, but the, the thing that gets put get put on the sidebar every now and then, which is like a roundup of some sort? Yes, he, he's he sometimes gets in those, um, and uh, I think he's he has other distribution channels that have worked well for him as well. But uh, the the kind of the baseline for his newsletter, at least the way I understand it, is. Uh, you know, being engaged and participating in the indie hackers community for quite a while. He's also in the mega maker community uh, and he was able to leverage these communities he was involved in to do this newsletter and to have some ways of distributing it and getting the word out. Yeah, lovely. I, I was asking because I keep seeing him. I didn't know it was a newsletter. Actually, I, I was confused myself whether it's somebody that works at Indie Hackers because they were very well written and pretty much a, a, a roundup of of ideas or different things, which, yeah, it, it was it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Indie Hackers newsletter is is doing partnerships with newsletters where because um, like Drew, is it Drew Riley has um, has Indie.vc. Is that right? No, not Indie.vc. Trends.vc. Turns up, you see. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. Uh, they, they do spotlights on those newsletters inside the Indie Hackers newsletter. Yeah. Very interesting. Can I ask you, Justin, this is a question coming from me. Um, we, we, we keep bouncing between bootstrapping and podcasting or subscriptions, but I want to get back a bit to podcasting. My question to you would be, what makes a great host great on a podcast? And uh, I I'm asking mainly for myself as I'm doing, like, it's a bit egoistical, I'm doing these AMAs and all that. I, I, I just love your input because I know you've done a couple of podcasts. You said earlier too, but I swear when I was researching this, I saw your name more than just on two. And I can actually name Mega Maker, Proc People, and Build Your SaaS. Did, mm -hmm. did I miss... Do I remember incorrectly that number that figure it's two? Uh, yeah, I've done I've done <laughs> I've done tons of podcasts. Uh, yeah, uh, I have one called Six Seconds. That was uh, every episode was I only six that. seconds long. Yeah, yeah, I, it, and it was it was dubbed the shortest podcast there is, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, the shortest podcast in the world. Yeah, yeah, I saw that and I thought, yeah, this guy hosts on Transistor because that that's what unlimited podcast means <laughs> after all. <laughs> Yeah, that was part of that was part of my insight. Is I, I kept wanting to start new shows. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of things that make a good podcasting host. I think uh, having an established reputation in an in a community, you know. So, um, you know, if you go back and you listen to like Wes Boss's first podcast or Tim Ferriss's first podcasts, they're not super great. <laughs> they're you know they're they're figuring things out too, but what they had was they built up a reputation in a community and, you know, they were able to kind of bring that over to their show and people were just excited to hear from them, even though they weren't the most polished at the beginning. So having an existing audience or reputation can help. 
if you don't have an existing audience or reputation, uh, you can do interviews and you're basically then, you know, inviting other people to come on your show and leveraging their audience and their uh, influence. And you've definitely done a good job of that. Like even being on Twitter spaces has this like natural traction channel because all of my followers can see that I'm live right now in, in the Twitter bar uh, in addition to yours. So you kind of get, you know, you get this, this uh, magnified reach uh, and every one of my followers that joins, it, it then shows up in their Twitter bar. So Twitter spaces has kind of I've, a natural traction channel right now. I've uh, read this article about surfing. I'll send it your way. That This guy was saying some interesting stuff about being on the, uh, uh, <laughs> on, on, on some tailwinds. So, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it helps to ride the wave when it's, you know, when it's building. Um, yeah, that's what the guy was saying. Very interesting <laughs> point. I'll send it your way after this, <laughs> after this spaces room. Yeah, uh, yeah I, and I think being learning to be authentic on the microphone takes practice, but is a good skill. Um, being, I think, also learning to not have everything scripted. So a few times in this conversation, you've decided to pause even though you might have another question and go, hold up, let's just dig into that a bit. Or just wait a second, I wanna push back on that. And not being scared to push back, not being scared to just pause and really dig into an issue uh, as an interviewer. Um, I think actually this is what makes Adam Wadden a great interviewer, like go listen to Full, uh, Full Stack Radio. He just will dig into he he will not give people an easy pass. He'll he'll push back, mm. and that's what people find interesting. It's like whoa, he really got to the bottom of that, you know? Um, yeah, that's interesting. And I think too many people are in a rush to get through their bullet point questions, and they're too nervous. Just slow it down. It's okay <laughs> to just. I love that. Give yourself. Uh, I have to do this all the time. Like I start talking way too fast, slow it down. Uh, one thing I'm still learning with um, John Buddha, who I've been, you know, we've been co-hosting this podcast forever, is I just need to give him space to speak. And it's a podcast. We're not recording it live. So just, you know, talk and then just pause and give him space to collect his thoughts and speak. Um, so that people don't have to listen to jackass like me all the time, you know? Um, so I, uh, I think there's things you'll notice along the way. Uh, I've also been willing to open myself up to criticism. I've got this hilarious email from Ben Ornstein, like way back when I was in product people, where I asked him to give me feedback on product people and we didn't know each other at the time. And, you know, he, he was pretty like upfront about the things I could, I could uh, change. And he was right. Uh, And, you know, those are things I've tried to practice as I go along. I think I'm an okay podcast host Uh, there. You know, I'm, I'm, I've still got lots to learn myself, but people definitely want to be engaged. There has to be something compelling about what you're doing. You're not going to get it the first time. It's probably best to just start and start practicing. Uh, But eventually you want to cultivate these skills and this practice of, you know, how can I be more engaging? How can I be more compelling? How can I really, you know, get into issues that people care about? Uh, Maybe we should record for 30 minutes and just not publish that and only publish the last quarter which is usually the most interesting part of any conversation. So, uh, yeah, I think just kind of working on it as you go along, picking up good techniques from other people, emulating the folks that you admire until you can kind of figure out your own style, all of that helps. And, and uh, honestly, that helps with almost everything, whether you're trying to get traction on Twitter, a blog, video, uh, you're kind of always trying to figure out what's my angle, how can I do this authentically? How can I be more engaging, more compelling? Um, yeah. I understand. And to the point of emulating, 
some other people you look up to. Well, you're one of the people I look up to uh, since since we're here, <laughs> and that sort of thing of getting to the bottom of things is. Uh, I didn't know Adam is doing that, but I'm definitely going to check out his podcast after this. But I am basically trying to emulate the, uh, do you know Guy Raz and his uh, how I built this? Podcast? Yeah, yeah, I like I like Guy Raz, and and I also like to uh, note the things that annoy me about the people <laughs> I like. You know, there's I have lots of annoying habits and annoying. I don't know. You know, people sometimes will mention to me. <laughs> you know, the, the things that I do that maybe turn them off or whatever. And I think that can be good fuel for new creators to be like, okay, so like how I built this is a great show, but I often find it too polished. Um, really? I, yeah. I think it's a little bit too polished sometimes. This is just me. I think I it's mean, a great it's show. NPR. It, yeah. It's got that NPR feel, which in some ways is great. I, I find that he doesn't always really understand the markets and the categories he's describing. It's a little bit too surface for me. So when I interview somebody now, I really want to have a sense. It's like, it's one of the reasons I don't do like just a general uh, interview show because I really want to be in their world. Uh, You've mm. been able to ask me a bunch of questions because you're in this world, you're in this indie SaaS, uh, indie hacker uh, world. And, uh, you know, I think there's lots of benefits to that. So, yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm, we're, we're going to have to go probably, on. we're going to have to wind this down soon because my AirPods are at 10%. <laughs> so, yeah, no worries. Uh, so I've probably got like five, 10 minutes left. We we can That's okay. we can we can go until till the AirPods die, and then we're gonna have a big big cutout. Yeah, and we, we're gonna say goodbye, Justin. Yeah, we we can fly till the AirPods die. Yeah, there we go. Uh, one thing I wanted to note on the on the guy Ross thing is I'm about to say something that might sound like we're we're having a different opinion, but I I think we're kind of on the same opinion. Actually, I was mentioning him earlier because that emulation bit I was trying to learn from him was. You know how he goes in his podcast, like, wait, 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 so hold on a second. You guys were doing X and then Z happened. But what about Y? So uh, that's that's the sort of thing I was trying to emulate, which is, I guess I'm more looking at him and his hosting skills mm -hmm. than his knowledge about the, the, the industry he's tackling on, which I guess is fairly normal because he has quite a broad spectrum of people on his uh on his show yeah just uh just that i'm being silent now because this might be the the moment where the airports have fallen <laughs> off the radar i i'm i'm back is it on, yes because your voice is different i'm back on speakerphone yeah that's fine sorry sorry you were you were just saying that you're trying to emulate his style um which I think is great. And as, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I wasn't saying anything. Oh, uh, the, you know, and, and there's still some things you can learn from, especially, you know, radio people who've been doing this forever. There's a great interview between Alex Bloomberg and Ira Glass. Uh, Alex Bloomberg had his own podcast called, uh, I can't remember what it was called. Um, but it's, it's just a fascinating interview into how Ira started in radio and cultivated all these skills and learnings that made him, you know, such a compelling personality. And, um, yeah, if you're interested in being a good podcast host, I think you should have, uh, an interest in some of those things, you know, yeah. uh, how can I, how can I really learn from folks that have been doing this for a long time and emulate them? Is it uh, uh, Alex Bloomberg and Ira Glass? Is it on uh, Stable? We are stable .com or BBC Radio 4 Extra Podcast Hour? I I'm just trying to find the name so we can direct people, but I guess I found it yeah. by searching Ira Glass and Alex Bloomberg. Yeah. Uh, it's on... Oh, it's on a podcast called Without Fail. Oh, there we go. Ira Glass, the man who launched a thousand podcasts. Yeah. Um, 
we for for those last five to ten minutes, I guess we've um, um, we've run out of of questions from from the audience. But I don't want to let this slip. So because I had a list of questions, uh, you tell us when you have to go, Justin. And thanks again for being this for this uh, almost Joe Rogan length. I think we're <laughs> two hours and a half into this, are we? Oh, there we go. We have we have Darko who was here earlier, probably for a follow up question or something. I'm just adding him now as a speaker. I would have hated to have the last question. So let's let's have him back. Which, by the way, Darko, from the moment you've uh, asked your question, I went on Indie Hackers because we were talking about it, and you're number two, 22 upvotes. Have my upvote as well, 23. Yeah, well, it's funny that you mentioned this guy because. Uh, you know, indie hackers has this series thing where they, uh, you know, like illustrators and uh, they have this scoreboard. I'm currently number one there with around 7,000 subscribers. Oh, wow. But, yeah, but uh, I, I think I need to understand more about indie hackers uh, as an audience. And that's why I wanted to ask you, Justin. Basically, my newsletter is about uh, user acquisition and uh, more specifically, I do this weekly uh, weekly series where I pu publish like a post called user acquisition channel. So, for example, uh, LinkedIn launched a, a new ad format called LinkedIn um, uh, event ads. So I uh, analyze those news and kind of find the opportunity, for example, uh, you have uh, with a new ad format, you always have this opportunity of novelty where people are like, uh, hey, this is a new thing and you get like a higher CTR, lower, uh, basically a lower cost to, to like acquire a customer. But I'm kind of struggling to monitor. I did one experiment when I, where I tried to monetize it, and it failed like spectacularly. You know, I usually publish the top three opportunities, and then I was like, "Hey, if you want to get like access to the rest of the tree, subscribe to this Substack." And basically, a bunch of people clicked, but nobody subscribed. So I was like. I'm not understanding something about this particular audience. And then you mentioned uh, this guy with software ideas and he is basically targeting people at the, when they're not in the promotion stage, where they're in the idea of finding stage. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to depend on a few things. Um, the key at any given time is to ask yourself, how do I know that people want this and will pay for it? Like what evidence do I have that they'll do that? Now you can just launch it and see who pays. And that may be a signal. It might not be the definitive signal because maybe if you'd launched it in a little bit of a different way, it would have got more traction and you would have, um, you know, you would have had better success. So maybe you should launch it a couple different ways and see if any of those work. That's one way to test it out. But I'd also be looking for outside signal that there is some inherent demand from folks and not just demand that they're going to want to consume it, but they'll actually pay for it. And some categories, some topics, some markets, some audiences are just not as willing to pay or they're not as incentivized to pay as others. Um, and these things can ebb and flow. Um, you know, I remember uh, it's probably been eight years, maybe 10 years, you know, when PATH, uh, the, the app, the social network PATH was at its peak. Um, design was kind of design for startups were really big and um you you know that was kind of like peak designer news that was everyone was hiring a lead designer um and that trend has kind of waned in recent years for multiple reasons so for a while you could be really focused on designers and design 
first startups and, um, you know, earn money in different ways. And now I would say that wave is kind of subsided, um, although there might be new opportunities kind of emerging out of there. So you need to say, you know, at this stage of time, what evidence is there that their people are interested in this enough to pay for it. If you haven't listened to it yet, listen to uh, the most recent interview with Vincent Wu on Indie Hackers. And he articulates this so well. Um, the way he says it is when, he, when people come to him with business ideas, he says, what, what evidence do you have that the customer has an economic incentive to pay for this thing. And you can kind of see this retroactively with like, for example, Tailwind has a lot of this built in, right? There's an economic incentive for companies to buy it because it makes it easier, faster, uh, more efficient for them to build UIs without having to hire a bunch of extra design help. Uh, it, there's an incentive for developers to purchase it because many of them are working on their own indie projects and um, they, they, they don't want to hire a designer or they want to just do the design themselves and having a bunch of UI components they can buy and use. There's a lot of momentum there. There's a lot of incentive there, but some topics, some categories, people are just not as incentivized and these waves can come and go. Like right now, you know, there's a, there's a market for some of these email newsletters, but it might not last forever. Uh, people's tastes change and, and market demand can fluctuate. So you kind of got to time it right and look for signals uh, that, you know, there's something there. And it might mean launching it a couple different times. I mean, sorry. Yeah, um, this was just one of the three offers I wanted to test. And it, it had the least likelihood to work, I knew it, but at the same time, it was like you mentioned, with it was the easiest for me basically to do. But yeah, mm -hmm. what one thing about launches too is that those take practice, like it, if that was your first launch ever, um you certainly couldn't expect it to go well. Uh, this is one of the advantages, one of the advantages of, you know, being a multi-project person and having a string of things you've worked on is that you can compare and contrast, you know, <laughs> um, and also having a community that's sharing their experience. So publicly you can compare and con contrast your experience with their experience. And again, um, being able to see my friends build and launch things and the response they were getting, the click-through rate they were getting, I was able to ask myself some questions like, okay, is it the market? Is it the product? Is it me? Is it, you know, my launch sequence? What's the issue here? And di kind of diagnose it from there. Uh, and in some cases, the answer is you just not practiced enough. Gotcha. Lovely. Um, Darko, uh, I'm not really sure if you're done with your question. I hope that answers your question. Can you just confirm it to us? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you, Justin. And uh, thank you, CH Daniel. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for, thanks for your question and for your follow-up. And congrats, by the way, uh, having the biggest uh, newsletter on Indie Hackers. I don't know if you can do that on Indie Hackers, but having the biggest audience is definitely something you need to be congratulated for. Uh, Justin, are we about to wrap this up? Yeah, let's. Uh, I think it's a good time to wrap it up. I, I, I've got a, I've got a flash question. Yeah, to... and and just to remind folks, I'm I am gonna after I get off the call here and I have some lunch, I'm gonna be answering questions on this Reddit AMA, um, on uh, on R slash SAS. So if you want to go there and uh, upvote it and add a question, I haven't got to any of them yet, and I think I'm getting downvoted because. I haven't answered no. any questions yet, but no, you've got 27 upvotes in two hours, which by my standards is really good. Oh, okay, great. Um, but yeah, if folks want to go there after and um, ask me a question, I, uh, I'll, I'll be there and uh, definitely appreciate your questions there. Yeah, uh, this is AMA Ask Me Anything.
Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It, can I ask you anything? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's always a, there's a, Oh, look at you pushing the limits. I like this. <laughs> no. uh, yes, you can ask me a question. I, I can't guarantee I'll answer it, but go ahead. Like anything, anything, but I ask it, you might answer, you might not. That's right. Okay. How do I look like you when I get to 40? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Uh, well, one key is you just, you just have the profile photo you took four years ago on your <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> that helps. Um, I mean, I've always looked young. It was a, this was a, this was a, a disadvantage when I was 13 and 14. Uh, <laughs> cause I, you know, I was, I felt like I was, you know, way behind all my peers, but it's turned out to be okay in my, in my older age. And, and who knows, like you, you folks see a, 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 uh, a filtered version of me. If you get up close, <laughs> you'll see all my stress lines and, and everything else. <laughs> but because that, that's the thing somebody else asked you something similar and they also mentioned after four kids i'm i'm 23 you had your first kid when you were one year younger than me yeah so i'm guessing that contributed to those stress lines you mentioned which <laughs> i can't relate to unfortunately uh yeah i mean there's i think uh like one thing that actually one thing that i invested in that ended up being great um uh, that helps a lot is I just always used to get cheap haircuts, like $5, five minute haircuts. And when I moved to Vernon, I found this incredible barber, Brett Kelly. You can follow him on Instagram. He's unbelievable. And he has this shop that's like right beside my office. And uh, if I ever look okay, it's because of him. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was actually from the, from the first time I've seen you online. I was admiring the the pompadour because you 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 rock it in a in a nice manner, and <laughs> I think that contributes as well to the younger look. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's true. Sometimes uh, sometimes my daughter's like, Dad, like, quit wearing hoodies. You know, you got to dress your age. <laughs> <laughs> Is it something like Dad, you're embarrassing me, or Dad, grow up? Which one of them? <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, come on, Dad. Yeah, you, you can, huh. yeah, get a get a pair of khakis, man. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So that's the secret: the pompadour, um, <laughs> kids, because somehow they make you younger, apparently, despite common knowledge. Yeah, uh, Justin, this was lovely. I really enjoyed this. Um, I didn't know we would go almost three hours into it, but I'm thrilled to go for as long as possible. Is there anything we've missed? Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, no, just uh, I'm I'm still keen to answer your questions as authentically and uh, honestly as I can. So if you want to ask questions on Reddit and share that with your friends that might also be interested. Um, yeah, that'd be that'd be great. And um, let's let's continue this there. There we go. There we go. Besides Twitter, uh, is there what's the best place to follow you or your work? Oh, I, I mean, I'd love it if people subscribe to the Mega Maker podcast and I write at justinjackson.ca. There we go. And of course, transistor.fm if anybody's looking for podcast hosting. Yeah, we, yeah, we'd love to have you. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, oh, by the way, I forgot to bring this up, but I think it was actually on me to remind you that you are giving people a, a discount code. You sent the link to me, so I should have brought this up on the subreddit. Uh, there, there was a, a voucher code, if I remember correctly. That's right. Yeah, it'll be. We can link to it on the Reddit thread. There we uh, go. There we um, go. But yeah, you, there there's a, a special discount code for the the Reddit AMA today. Which I'm assuming is time limited. So if people want to cash in on this, they better move fast because it's not going to be there forever. Yeah, yeah. If they want to start a podcast, we we never do coup coupon codes. This is the first public coupon code we've done. Wow. So, uh, if you, if you want to say more, if you say want, more, my, if you my want, ego feels very good right now. <laughs> say more. If you want a deal, this is the time to get it. We'll see. This will determine if we do it again. But yeah. Oh, OK. This, so anybody listening to this and being on the fence for the sake of of me telling Justin, see this work, do it again. <laughs> please cash in on it right now or soon. Ah, uh, what have we done? I've become a, a telemarketer right now with, <laughs> in this sort of space. That's what three hours does to you. Uh, thanks very much Justin for being here this was a blast thanks everybody for joining in here and I see some names have been here for the whole almost three hours so wow massive respect we've got upcoming AMAs with Hit and Shot that's the next on 
uh, Tuesday. You've got the full schedule on the subreddit with Chris Messina, the inventor of, of the hashtag, the Typefully guys, and also the Mailbrew guys, same people. Uh, loads and loads of guests. We're doing about two a week. As Justin said, uh, feel free to direct yourselves to Reddit SAS right now, a, a bit later, maybe even tomorrow. Uh, thanks all for being here. Feel free to DM me with suggestions, criticism especially on how this went, whether I can make it better, uh, whether it's harsh or nice, I want to hear it. And uh, yeah, Justin, for the last time, thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me and thanks everyone who showed up. It was really fun. Talk to you later. Lovely. Lovely. Have a, have a nice Thursday. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Bye-bye.